From the Dice Abide Live studios, it's Late Night War Games with your hosts, Adam and John. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, and hello, everyone. I'm Adam, occasionally known as the Dice Abide. I'm John, a.k.a. Wise Can't Say. This evening, we are joined by the heavy gear rules designer himself, the Rooster. Hey. Hello, everybody. Yay. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, oh, thank man. you. I'm glad you could make it tonight. Yeah, it's, it's awesome to be here. I I'm, I'm really enjoy your show. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm glad somebody enjoys it. Um, so, uh, guys, what are, you, what are you drinking tonight? Rooster? Uh, I am drinking Dos Equis. Oh. Excellent. I am More than one Equis. Yep. I'm having a Battlestar IPA. Nice. Where, what, uh, what brewery is that? That's Crux. Oh, okay. I have not had that one. I think it's new. I have to give it a shot. Yeah, my, my lovely um, wife selected it for me, so. Seems good. You have to bring some over next time. Okay, deal. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so for me tonight, I, I went on a recent expedition to the local 99 Ranch uh, and raided their instant noodle aisle. And You're while I was kind of perusing, I'm drinking instant noodles. That's how it's actually just instant beer at hot water. It's really not good. No, uh, <laughs> instead, I found this uh, this beer right here which is from Kizakura Kyoto beer. Oh, okay. Something, something right? sake? It sounds, yeah, it's, uh, it's made with sake yeast. Oh, neat. So it's, it's pretty damn good. Uh, and it was really expensive for a <laughs> little bottle of beer. So I'm glad I wasn't disappointed. Um, but yeah, it, it's the, apparently this is the first IPA brewery in Japan. Hmm. That's their, their claim to fame. So... That's, That's cool. what I'm having. Well, very nice. Gentlemen, cheers. 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 On bye. Oh, man. Oh, that's actually really nice. It's it's kind of, if you like sake, it has that kind of uh, floral, fruity aftertaste, but with kind of like a light beer front. Really good. I would recommend it. Um, all right. Well, before I go on too much about the beer, <laughs> it's time for the evening news. John, do we have some news? I do. <clears throat> <laughs> so, um, yeah, this first bit is that we are officially sponsored now by DreamPod Nine. Hey, hey. they like the they they liked the thing that we did the last couple episodes. Apparently, talking about them. Uh, got their attention, and they are now going to uh, basically help us out by providing us with sweet toys to talk about and review and play games with. And in return, we are going to be doing monthly episodes based on Heavy Gear. Also, so, you guys get to benefit too, because we're going to be raffling off sweet toys for you. So same same rules will apply. Basically, at some point during uh, a show, we will um, raffle something off. A good time. Yep. Not this show, but not this show. Uh, one coming up very soon. Yep. Hint. Maybe next time we do one. a heavy gear. <laughs> so, yeah. So it just means that we're going to be playing with more heavy gear toys, which is great because, you know, we love Infinity, but we also like dabbling in big stompy mecha. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Vanderbane, I like both toys and raffles. Looks like you're in the right place. <laughs> you absolutely are, Vanderbane. John, do we have any Bromat Academy? Yeah, speaking of stuff you can win, um, this month is uh, clo closing up fast, but if you want to send in a game where you planned out your second turn and executed to the letter what you wrote down at the beginning, that's uh, this month's Bromat Academy mission, so go ahead and send that in for a chance to win a, a blister or Bromat Academy patch. It looks, it looks like the logo, for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, if you want to paint something up, you can do that. You can paint up a big, stompy robot. Uh, no, no heavy gear stuff this time. Just infinity tags, but maybe next month we'll include. Sorry, next next Ooh. quarter we'll include uh, some some things. We'll see, we'll see. Um, and uh, infinity, the academy has two new articles. One is a article on um, uh, doing um, a example game 
right? So it takes you through everything from start to finish, uh, even including you know some simplistic scoring. And then um, so I wrote an article on uh, some other stuff too. So you can go check that out. Um, there's a there's some list building tips that I don't my wrote and I sort of cobbled together into a more coherent thing. And we will release <laughs> some more um, list building tips in the intermediate rules section. So if you have a look at that, um, that's that's basically the deal there. So it's infinitytheacademy.com. Check that out, or it's a link in the Bremen Academy page if you want to see that. And if you want to show a little extra support for Infinity the Academy, you can get a T-shirt with that sweet logo on it. Yes, from that's true. The Dice of Threadless. Yep, and all of that's on the um, uh, the Academy site as well. If you want to see that? Um, yeah. Speaking of stuff oh, that yeah. we didn't do, but other people have, we'll talk about uh, what. Uh, <laughs> Did. Yeah, so my my buddy Damon has finally launched my T Freighter. This is the very first the very first version, which uh, he had me paint up for him right here. It's basically a fully modular YT kit. So, all like it's in a million pieces in this picture. Um, so like the front half, you've got the left half, the right half, the center piece, uh, the body. You can change basically everything about the ship, so you can build whatever custom YT class uh, freighter ship that you want. Either to use them in the third or their X Wing scale. So you can use them in X Wing, or you know, if you're playing a Star Wars campaign, you want to have your custom YT that you cruised around in. So, yeah, this is the uh, the basic configuration that he launched with. I kind of went for like a, um, a Spaceballs Winnebago feel, was kind of what I was inspired by with the uh, with the design here. And from here, he's going to be doing uh, additional kits so where you can download more stills uh, and basically modify it as you go along. You should, One of the really you should, cool things. Hmm? Just goop a little bit of stuff and paint it red in the dish. Yes. <laughs> what? Uh, what? Um, geez, lost track. Oh, I would say what's really cool is that this whole model right here. There's no glue on it. So the entire, all the different pieces are either pressure fit or magnetized. I guess there's glue holding the magnets in, but. Though the whole point is that you can actually, if you print out a bunch of the different pieces, you can play with it like a fidget toy and like disassemble it and reassemble it. That's pretty sweet. Cool. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Speaking of other 3D printed things, um, just a quick heads up, Chris Over Monsters Makings is back in the saddle after a bit of a hiatus. Um, he finished a viral pistol, um, some pano gun thing, which I forget right now. And then he also has rigged up uh, Shang G forearms and some light and heavy infantry for our, uh, hands as well. So if you know Blender, you can play with them. Um, he's also said that he's going to start making some of his his creations a little more exclusive. So you can still get them through his monsters making shop, but um, you won't just be releasing all of them to the public anymore. So those Shang G uh, forearms are actually uh, destined for Frank, who was the Berman Academy painting winner. So um, congratulations again. To there Frank. we go. Yeah. Um. So those hands you said on the Shang G forearms are fully are, are fully rigged, so you can pose them however you want. Yes, sir. I'm waiting for like the first uh, thing reincarn or incarnation from. Oh, right. Uh, yep. Yeah. Power power armor roving hand. There you go. That's a I thing. approve. Uh, speaking of sites that we've you know we frequent, uh, we've also relaunched Lumbering Sprocket, um, which uh -huh. is our heavy gear eh eh fan site. Get it? Lumbering. Heavy Ooh, right, sprocket I'll, here. I'll see myself out. Um, but yeah, uh, so much <laughs> like the Roman Academy start article that I wrote for Infinity, I cobbled together one for Heavy Gear Blitz. Uh, you can check it out here. It has all the things you need, including a, a choosing a fashion article by none other than Adam, as well as a <gasps> quick guide of like what you need to buy and what you should build, because there's, there's lots of options. So you know you might get sucked into a little bit of analysis paralysis, but uh, it's not it's not all bad. And the article goes over what you need and all that stuff. And the models are pretty, so you should you should get them. Um, yeah. Let's see. Oh, and then there's well a done. there's an Infinity Defiance update, right? So here's some some oogling mm. we can do at the reinforcement pack. So here's the Pano and Nomad one. Um, also the oh, Planet man. exclusive stuff. So they they they're proving to us that they're here and they're going to be shipping soon. Um, and they are aware of all of the um, the UK uh, Brexit-related uh -huh. issues. And so they are currently trying to figure out a way that uh, sucks the least for everybody. And... They're going to be smuggling them through the channel. <laughs> yes. I, pack, I'm... Packing their coats full of defiance packs. I'm 100% sure that's exactly what Bostry is doing right now. 
it's a lot of trips, but it's worth it. Yep. Especially with how high those freaking import fees are. Yes. Um, yeah, no, those reinforcement packs were such ridiculously good deals. Yeah. I, yeah, no, they were so good. Yep. I wanted to buy them all. Yeah. They're a little behind because of COVID and, uh, and also, uh, it's, it's COVID plus Chinese New Year. So, like, those two things together that kind of like tanked their shipping schedule for Wave 2. But sure. That's, that's happening. I'm, that means I'm not going to get any of my Warhammer recasts anytime soon. Right. Because <laughs> you don't have enough to assemble. I should just drive my stuff over for you to assemble. Oh, please so. don't. <laughs> please don't. Oh, man. So. It's party time. Let's uh let's talk about some some toys we put together. So yeah, here we are. I've been working on my black talons for heavy gear as long as as well as a little bit of my north. So at the top there we can see I've managed to get primer down on, on the black talons that I currently have, except for the Naga. It's basically I just use like a GW black primer, and then I have found my new favorite spray primer in the world, which is Vallejo Panzer Gray. Mm. It's basically a very, very, very dark gray. It basically it reads black. If you just look at it, you're like, oh, that model's black. But it, it's light enough that it gives you room to actually shade it further. So when you want to paint something with black armor, for example, right, you hit it with that first, then you go into all the recesses, which is what I did here on this dark Kodiak. Uh, so I hit it with black, Zenith it with the Panzer Gray, went in with black ink through all the recesses and kind of on some of the armor plates, feathering it out mm-hmm. to push the contrast quite a bit deeper. So really happy with how the black is coming out. This is a pretty quick paint job. It's just, yeah, I, I did what I just did right there. I, I zapped it with a little bit of a Zenithal or specular highlights with the airbrush with some, I believe it was Thunderhawk blue from GW, which is basically just field gray. And then some very light blue gray uh, edge highlighting and scratches. Nice. It really just, it really just makes the, the depth of that armor uh present (laughs) you know it's so easy with with, uh black models to to look really flat Mm -hmm. and what some people do and i've seen other people do and i haven't decided if i'm gonna mimic it but where they they start changing things so for example like uh, one of the one of my favorite black talent models i've seen which is where i copied this exact pose from he painted a lot of the panels dark gray instead of black and it gives that additional depth but Mm. i really like the the black on black stealth feel so i want to lose as little of that as possible so i'm just doing the dark gray on some of the like um like the joints and servos things gotcha. like that and so i want to try to i want to try to keep the it. material a little yeah exactly i want to try to keep it as like stealth coated black as possible and then his weapons are green because they're whatever he picked up out of the armory i'm gonna go shoot people with this now and it also it also helps uh helps you see them on the table and it, it fits fine um, yeah. you know, same thing with like the red rockets and things like that. You right. know, if you're, if you're really doing black talons, like by the book, they just like stealth coat everything and call it a day. Mm. Like, we don't have time to think about it. We don't need to make it look pretty. We just need it to absorb as much, you know, <laughs> RF as possible. Yep. Makes sense. So, and then, yeah, so I've got my Jaguars there that I hit with another Vallejo spray. Oops, sorry. Another Vallejo spray, which is the British uniform which is a damn near close to the official paint scheme for North. So I'm pretty happy with how that came out. And then the Naga, I got some, the Karabayusha um, accessory <laughs> uh, accessory pieces from Gundams mm-hmm. to change the rotary laser barrels on this. I didn't, they're pretty flat on the stock model. So I filed them down, give them some more depth. I feel nice. that. Yeah, just kind of, su- I'm trying to super detail the Naga. I want to put a lot of extra work into the Striders so that, since they're, you, know, you only get like one. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. I will be sure to medium anti tank missile it immediately. No. <laughs> Why, John? That's mean. This, this uh, so I, I also got some infinity building though. Yeah. There we go. I I built the Jath cutthroat box, which now means I'm up to f- all five different poses of Jath cutthroat plus the little uh, little tiger creature buddy. I, I, I love the tiger creature like because he's just like i'm also big and scary look at me go right and he's kind of the most terrifying of the bunch yeah um, <laughs> but no they're rad models it, if, if you play combined or shazvasti and you have the defiant set your army is going to look great because everything is going to look unique you know this is five jth cut right here there's not a single duplicate pose among them mm-hmm. so 
it just looks really solid. I'm I'm pretty happy with how that came out. Yeah, it looks good. I like the base top. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Sean, what have you been working on? Well, uh, Tim has been working on a lot of stuff, and I paid him for it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, his. I finally have all the things now. I I found an MO box online on eBay for cheap. So that's on my building desk. This is all the pieces. The MO of box? Con- uh, MO box? Military orders. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, MO. Yeah, MO box. Not A-M-M-O. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I have one of those too, but that doesn't really help. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is a, a shock army, right? So uh, I bought basically everything that I was missing from him, which is all he had, which is convenient. And there's some Caprice Ammons in the back there that are being magnetized. Um, yeah. So now I have shock, which is great. I'm going to um, probably rebase them and redo the paint. Sorry, Tim. I thought that the paint is bad. I just uh, want to do not blue pano. So <laughs> there's that. Uh, I'll probably, I'm thinking about doing, because I have them on the um, Secret Weapon Miniatures flight deck bases, so I'm going to, the same as my Corregidor. My Corregidor is gray bases. I'm going to do these on like a dark blue and then do like mm. a very light sort of bone and um, crimson color scheme for my pano and like do it all icy and stuff. So be interesting. We'll see what happens. Um, I fixed my LHT-67 AA to have the right missiles on it because that was bothering me. So I took the old, uh, the, the Caprice ATM, chopped off one of the tubes and glued it to the side of the turret. That looks perfect, man. Right? Yeah. I mean, this That's is actually anti-air missiles. Yeah. No, this is uh, this is the uh, anti-tank missiles. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. All right. Looks good. Yeah, and it's so actually the, the same tube. At least that's what the HC3A has in its box. So I assume the hex, mm-hmm. the hexagon tube is the right one. Um. And then I'm painting up this figure for the MayaCast thing, well, so I can't show it to you. But I'm <laughs> I'm pretty happy with the way it's coming out so far, uh, and I will show it off to Tom and Kip, and they'll probably be like meh, but that's okay because yeah. I just want to put it put it in the thing to support yeah. them. So, that's... Tom, this is a family show. I don't think we can be showing this on here. <laughs> it... <laughs> oh, I can't believe you'd bring that inappropriate. <laughs> Uh, I also finally put some sand on uh, all the uh, infantry that we got from our last DP9. Order. Oh, there we go. Um, and I'm starting. You can see I'm starting the MO assembly on the left there. Um, and then I, I right right after dinner, I, uh, I I airbrushed the tanks and a little bit of Xena thing, and I'll probably get some striping and pick out some stuff out. So we'll we'll see how it goes. Nice. It, those tanks are so freaking cool. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I might have to do new coal um, as an exception. Mean, yeah, oh, the fuselators, and they can take the uh, the LHT 67s. Yeah. Oh, can they? Oh, right, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah they can. Yeah. So, and, and I really like the, the look of the, the tiny hover tanks. So they are, they are pretty rad. I have to play that. Rooster, have you been doing any hobbying you can tell us about? Um, I do. Um, right now, I'm working on Peace River stuff. I don't really have anything I can show you or anything, but that's fine. Well, yeah, um, I'm messing with the plastics, uh, all the little parts. Um, there are a few, <laughs> and, uh, attaching them to the legs and uh, attaching the legs. So I, I do like that they're a little bit more um, dynamic than the uh, right. first kick. Oh yeah, that's yeah. what I've been up to. It's been hard for me to not uh, dig open that box right there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, saving that for there's Sorry. a lot of wins too. There, there's a lot of wins too with the uh, Kickstarter. I mean, yeah, talking about two dollars per model if you do the Kickstarter, and then of course they're they're less than the other stuff. Yeah, I definitely have a lot of, of the older pewters and stuff. Uh, just mm-hmm. in, they cost more, but you get all that dynamic posing and stuff with them too. And if you mix them together, you you really don't notice. So. Yeah, I noticed that with my North. Once I got primer on them and started putting them next to the metal miniatures, like uh, the differences faded away. Yep. Yeah. You'll notice when you pick them up, but that's about it. Right. Hey, well, and a pewter grizzly weighs about a pound and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so, very cool. Well, with that, John, what have you been playing? Well, I think been I playing, know. I've been playing you a lot. <laughs> 
I wasn't I wasn't sure if there was if there was somebody else you're getting games with or not. No. <laughs> so uh first up, yeah, John dragged me back through relearning. Oh, oh we're gonna do this first. Okay, we'll we'll talk about heavy. Oh, yeah, gear we, first. we can we can we can talk about oh, yeah. yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going in order of our show notes. Uh <laughs> Jumped again. Got excited. Uh no, so John dragged me through relearning um Netrunner, which is great. I played it a lot in the nineties because I'm a hipster, and then I played it when it first relaunched with FFG, uh probably through the first round of expansions, and then was like, I don't want to keep buying expansions and stop playing. So Yeah. I got I, to play last night. I played it pretty mm-hmm. competitively back in the first couple of sets of, of the FFG saga, but then I dropped out. Yeah, it's a rad game, and with it was a Reteki, Reteki. Yeah, R-E-T-E-K-I. so, so there's Jinteki.net and Reteki.fun, and Jinteki.net is the more popular site, but Reteki.fun, like they're the same code base, but Reteki.fun okay. lets you auto-generate a deck that's that's tournament oh. legal and also isn't like totally terrible, right? Because you could you can easily Ooh. generate like a a, a a deck that is technically legal but is just hot garbage. Um, but the Rayteki uh-huh. and like whatever heuristic algorithm they have running in the background makes things that aren't awful. And I would totally play them, maybe not in a super competitive tournament, but if both decks are in that format, it's absolutely fine. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, so there you go. If you want to play Netrunner or you just want to play a card game and not actually have to spend any money at all, like the the Rayteki and Jinteki websites are pretty freaking rad. Um it was a lot of fun. It made it really easy, like you know, because I'm familiar with the game. It's just been a while <laughs> since I played them, so it really made it easy to step back in. And you know, who doesn't want a, a really well done cyberpunk card game mm-hmm. that's free? Yep. So that was fun. All right, John. Now you can do it. Okay. Here's the slide. Here, Here we, we are. John, tell us about Heavy Gear that we played. Yeah, so uh, we played my CEF versus your Black Talons because you're really excited about it. Um, yeah, it was a good game. Played on this map. Uh, you crippled my APC and my one of my tanks like immediately before I had a chance to do anything, which super sucked because my hover my hover APC was just like limping along and not able to do anything. Um, but mm-hmm. I got you back because this this uh, raven on the right side of the picture there was the one that did the deed. It, it designated uh, my, my hover car for an artillery strike from something all the way across the table. And then like a bunch of angry, you know, grells, which are the, the 40K space marines of this universe, hopped out and blew up your stupid raven in one shot, which was pretty great. <laughs> Oh, that was so frustrating. And like to put that into context for the people, the Raven is basically like having a 40 point Ford observer in infinity, right? Like yeah. <laughs> here's this extremely expensive guy whose job is to point at something. Um, yeah. He's also really hard to hit, right? He's, he's basically like a TO camo model. And then like, yeah, this is the equivalent of like a Zanshi getting out and like blowing it away. <laughs> it's pretty great. Yeah. Um, let's we'll so, see what else happened. Um, that was painful. Growls hurt. Yep, stuff stuff sort of shuffled up. I had some I my poor tank was just in the open because I was like, ah, I might as well shoot something. Uh and then uh we had a little bit of a fight in or on the right side of the board. I ended up assassinate I was was it? I was running assassinate and capture and I blew up your owl. Is that thing called an owl, right? Yeah, my commander was an owl. Yeah, and then uh and then you had some kind of what kind of whatever the thing was holding my objective, so I ran up and slapped some shape targets on Cobra? you. Yeah, your dark cobra mm-hmm. and my Morgana growls were like, eh, whatever. I'm just gonna come in and CC you off the objective, which is exactly what happened. It was great. Yeah, I mean, like I've got this big stompy robot, and you basically charged it with like melta bombs. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So that felt pretty it, good. It hurt. Um. So I I won that I think three two, and then we basically re racked with um Caprice versus North, uh, just to do some testing of some fort of observation rules that we were working on. Um, and that went pretty, pretty, pretty fun too. Um, this was a, a ludicrous list of mine. So basically, my whole list was the Verder, which has essentially the biggest indirect gun you can get. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's like a mega forty k basilisk, and then everything else of mine was like Ford observers. Yep, it was just a bunch of cheetah, 
and their whole job was to target designate things for me to just shoot my one effective gun into the middle of and try to do as much damage as possible. I mean, you were deleting like one to two things like a shot though. You're like, nope, this <laughs> this like five inch bubble just take everything under this bubble away. <laughs> Black. <laughs> very much. Oh, and then I also took a I took a Kodiak, which I was very happy to be like, okay, cool. I'm gonna put the fear of the Kodiak in you, yep. and you just like smoked it turn one. Well, yeah, I just yeah, I, I couldn't leave you. Well, you left it in the open, right? So you like scooted it forward, shot it. I think my Bashan did some damage, yeah. and then like left it in front of five gears. So I was like, no, well, she's not fast. You can't have that. <laughs> I, I feel like you should have still left that in cover or something. But uh yep. Enough enough like rocket fire from some echoes took it down and then I, I think I face I planted a anti tank missile in its face and that did the rest. Yeah. <laughs> Gears don't stand up well to anti tank missiles. Nope. Yep. And if you play Infinity, Infinity tokens make great <laughs> great heavy gear tokens. <laughs> right. Because they, they do the same thing that you think they should do. And so your brain won't get confused. So yeah, those are our order tokens to keep track of the actions. Yep. Um, and I think I actually managed to get. Oh, I I think I must have grabbed the wrong picture. But at one point, you like dove. Uh, you you drove one of your photo observers like deep into my deployment zone to try to kill something, and yeah. like, just throw it under the bus. And uh, mm -hmm. I proceeded to uh, jump on you with all of my spider legs and and stab you to death, which was pretty great. Yeah, when you have four legs, you kick a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, so the backstory to Caprice, which is the faction I'm playing, right? They're big spider robots, and they climb. Like, their homeworld is, like, just a canyon, right? So they have these spike guns in their feet, which lets them, like, climb the rock face. And so they use those as close combat weapons, which is pretty hilarious. Uh, and it works really well. Killed, killed some of Adam's stuff, and that's that's the important part. Yeah, people underestimate the uh, the... The brawler capabilities and the hand-to-hand -hand combat, or the melee capabilities of Caprice, even though it's not necessarily super strong per individual model, when the other players are faced against it, usually the other players only have like a duelist or a handful of models. But when a whole force starts having brawler, that makes it a whole lot different thing to to deal with. Yeah, that it, it is. Well, it, it's kind of like um, you know, there are armies in Infinity where. Once you have access to close combat, wide, you know, widely like JSA, like suddenly that becomes a tool you can use. And when it when it is a tool that you can leverage, they can catch people off guard because they're not necessarily building to leverage it as well. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So it's pretty nasty. Yeah, Caprice is pretty good in close combat, so don't get that close, especially with Cheetos who are not good in close combat. They're they're hilarious bad, in fact. Don't they have brawler minus one? Yes. No, no, that's the, the ferret. Oh, that's the ferret. That's okay, the ferret. Okay. That's right. I, I was bringing cheetahs. I stabbed something to death, and you're like, this thing is brawler minus one. And I was like, okay, it's very dead. Yeah. <laughs> it it went splat. But no, that was a fun game. I think we tied that game. We did tie that game, yeah. Because you, you, like a coward, ran your white cat away. Absolutely. <laughs> My force commander was like, I'm not getting, like, your mission is to assassinate? I know what that means. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> Uh, oh no! You were that one was data scan. You I was trying to data scan, scan my leader. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yep. Nope. GTFO. He's going away. <laughs> <laughs> so again, another really fun game. I've really been enjoying these 100 point games on yeah. a four by four table, and it might just be because we're more familiar with four by four tables from playing Infinity, yeah. right? Like most of the games I play now are on four by four. But uh, I am looking forward to playing on a six by four with 150 points. Now that I have a little bit more terrain, we might be able to do that. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. So let's do it. Oh boy. Yeah, no, that was that was fun. All right. So that means it is time for some MOE game sponsorship. Woo! Yay. Thank you, MOE Games. For some reason I thought I had a oh here we go. Yay. There's the button. Yes, give a prize from Mythic Games. Looking for it. I rearranged everything. So here come the sweet prizes. Every week, Mythic Games provides one of our lucky listeners with a $10 gift certificate to moe-games.com. All you need to do to enter is literally just like hang out with us, talk with, talk with us in the chat box, yep. uh, watch our live stream, and you will have your chance for 10 bucks of toys. So given that you're already going to buy those toys anyways, 
ten dollars towards it. Not bad. Seems pretty good. So with that, you guys have about three more seconds to to make sure that, that you have said something at some point in time for our bots to know to enter you. Um, but yeah, they're not toys. They're critical hobby supplies, as Joe mentions. <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. So, yeah, just, excellent. Let's see. Hey, do I rock no die? Congratulations. <laughs> well done. Um, I'll go ahead and shoot you a message, and you can get me your contact information to pass over to Ruben for get hooking you up. So thank you very much. Um, and again, what was the name again? Why rock no die? Yeah, actually, I that's that's a really good point, Joe. Uh, Joe says at least he can get paid back in some small way for all the work he does in TTS. So for those of you who don't know, why rock no die is uh, the the current maintainer of the Infinity TTS mod. Um, so huge thank you, and uh, I'm I'm glad the RNG picked you because you need a uh, small something as a token of our appreciation. We should could do more. Uh, in fact, we probably can if you like open to Patreon or something. People might subscribe. Just, just saying. Cough, cough. People do those things. Excellent. <laughs> well. It's what you've all been waiting for. Our main feature. So tonight, we are introduced by. Uh, <laughs> we introduced. Well, we are joined by. This beer is not that strong. I don't know what my excuse is. Probably because I'm. I'm messaging oh, why rock no die at the same time to get this stuff over to Ruben. But we are joined by the rooster himself. You've probably seen him on the DP9 forums if you ever check those out. He is uh, act, quite active on the Discord. Basically, he is the guy who we get to both praise and blame for the 3.0 edition <laughs> of Heavy Gear Blitz. <laughs> uh, good to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, man, for putting up with us. Uh, you guys are awesome. I appreciate it, actually. We we do what we can. Awesome is uh, maybe more than we deserve, but I'll take it. So seems very right. for tonight. Tonight we are uh, basically gonna gonna give him a little interview. We have not officially actually have we interviewed someone? Not like this. No, this is you are yeah, you are our like, first official semi official interview. So right. Great. Now I'm more nervous. Yeah, right. So don't mess it up. You're because if anyone messes it up here, it's gonna be you. We're extremely experienced veterans of this. We've done this 44 times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, hopefully we can uh, we can get more uh, important or at least semi important people on here to talk about different games in the future. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe if these interviews are fun and people enjoy them, we can we can try to find more people to talk at. Oh, cool. So let's let's kick this off, uh, Mr. The Rooster, Mr. Rooster. Um, here's an easy question. What is your favorite Alice in Chains song? And why is it not The Rooster? Oh, no, it, it, you already know what my favorite Alice in Chains song is. It is, in fact, The Rooster. Well, I was going to say, is it Man of the Box? Like, is it? Oh, it, uh, the second most favorite? Yeah, I like Man of the Box, too. Man of the Box is pretty cool. There we go. We'll take one or the other. <laughs> that wasn't a hard one why why did you end up i mean are, are you the rooster on other forums or were you just listening to allison chains one day and you're like yeah this is this is who i'm gonna be now on heavy gear um it was uh honestly i i uh, go to school and i do a bunch of other things and i don't mean to sound rude to anybody but every now and then i've just got to turn the rooster off so i i use that as a way to to kind of put a space there and then and the rooster just clicked at the time, and I went with it. Excellent. Well, there we go. That is the the origin. Uh, it is a song. All right. So, um, when you're when you're not listening to all of us nerds tell you how to write rules, uh, what do you what do you find yourself doing? Oh well, um, well, well, yeah. There's a school and everything. I'm working on a BS. So, like chemistry, biology, math, all those things we all love. Um, and then. Um, I also do, uh, I'm working through the personal trainer book with the wife. We're both getting ready to be licensed personal trainers here soon. Oh, very cool. That's awesome. A lot of fun, yeah. Uh, and then uh, other than that, for fun, the wife and I would normally go to the gym. I know that sounds kind of dumb. We're gym rats, gym rats, but we are. And uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll go dance salsa. I met her. She was a salsa instructor in Okinawa, and, um, and that's how oh. I met her and everything. I was taking classes. 
So yeah, we'll we'll go down to uh, to Asheville actually because I'm over in North Carolina, and when they have something going on with a salsa event, we'll go there and do that. And that's my that's my. Other that, that is, is really that cool. Is not what I expected to hear that you are a salsa salsa dancing gym rat who also writes miniature <laughs> war game rules. Right, well, I was going to school too, right? Yeah, yeah, and you're going to school. So yeah. it sounds like you have lots of extra time. I don't know oh. what you do with yourself. <laughs> um, well, cool. So uh, how long have you been into miniature wargaming then? Um, well, I got into it in the 90s. So 30 years now. Right. You count chess, then actually probably oh, sure. like 40 years. I played there chess with my auntie as a kid. And that kind of counts. That's combined arms warfare, right? Yeah. Abstract. Sure. You put the word abstract in front of it. I think I think that counts. It didn't it count for just about anything. So what was your what was your very first game? Uh, first was uh, BattleTech. I, I was nice. uh, playing Great. Battle as a freshman, and um, yeah, uh, I I was one of those people that really uh, dug into it. I memorized all the rules. Um, I can be the biggest grognard about it, just like anybody else. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the only way to play BattleTech. Yes, you, right. You is have to be to, have, to, to yeah You're to be more doctor. right about the rules than your opponent. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that's that's how you determine the winner. I heard. Yeah. <laughs> have a debate, and whoever looks like they won won the battle. There you go. It's there's a there's a card game that I hate playing called Super Fight, where that's essentially the game. It's basically like pointless arguing the game. So and it doesn't sound too far off from Heavy Gear. Um, or from maybe you're from BattleTech. <laughs> so, um, what did you what did you play originally in BattleTech? Do you remember? Uh, well, I I know I did Swordsworn, and I know I did House Karita, uh, but mostly I think my favorite was Mercenaries. I always like putting together my own mercenary team and stuff like that. Very cool. So then, what made your what got you to transition? When did you discover Heavy Gear, the Heavy Gear universe? So I played Heavy Gear Fighter in uh, 1995 in high school. A friend brought the uh, card game to school, and we'd play periodically on lunches. And uh, I think I was hooked immediately at that point because the aesthetic feel to Heavy Gear. There's just something about it that has always drawn me to it. And then, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, we had the the Heavy Gear Fighter game, and I picked that up, and uh, we used to play that. And uh, from that was a card game, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, you're right. I should have emphasized that was a card game. And wow. uh, yeah, it's it's very it's very different than your oh, lot of your weird. Mind. Yeah. I want and, to find uh, that. Oh, it's exactly it's it's such a pleasure to play, really. I mean, it doesn't really function quite like a lot of your modern card games, but when you realize that it was made in 1995, this was like cutting edge stuff back then. And the way it plays is actually not bad at all. And it's a lot of fun to play. And there's Miranda Petit, by the way. They, she went on to be a character. Oh, nice. And I might have to find this just, just because I like obscure little games like that. It's all self-contained, which is very appealing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Certainly not something that's still receiving expansions. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Interesting. So this wasn't a collectible card game either, right? It was just a card game in a box. Yeah, you would buy it. In fact, it came in a VCR box of all things. No there way! It right there. VCR box, and um, it, it's just the way business was done back in 1995, and how card games, you know, first started coming about. Yeah. And you open it up; it still has the little holes there for where a, an actual tape would go or whatever. And um, but no, it's it's yeah, I got a I got a lot of appreciation for that game, and because um, it's it's what started me in the heavy gear, and it was the original. Thing oh, that that's came. really cool. Yeah, no, you mentioned you mentioned the VHS, and at first I feel like, oh, that's so weird. But then I remember, like, one of my very first jobs ever was working at a comic book store that had a pretty big war game section. And yeah, mm -hmm. there were like these old games. I think like Ogre, um, Viet Nova also mentioned uh, coming yeah. in the VHS boxes. I mean, mm -hmm. we're doing that now still, right? It's just it's just the, the common the common box shaped thing that you can get for cheap, right? So um, what is it? Right, um, right. Yeah. Death Ray, Death Ray Designs, right? They ship all of their uh, DVD boxes. Yeah, they, they, all of their mm -hmm. base toppers are laser cut acrylic, which they jam into a DVD box and they ship to your door. So, mm -hmm. makes sense. That's so funny. Oh. So, yeah. 
Wow. So what armies are you playing now in Heavy Gear then? Um, I will. I play them all. Uh, one of it is by Nature of the Beast. I do a whole lot of testing mm-hmm. and uh, I, I've come to appreciate all of them in certain ways. And I really do. I, I like all of them. I think my my current jam right now is uh, messing around with Peace River. Okay. I really, uh, get that boxy look to them. Um, they look killer. Yeah. Yeah, I I like the boxy features. It, I know that's easy, but I like that. Like I like um I started on the north, and of course that was back when there was really only the north and south. But I I always went for the boxy look too, even mm-hmm. back then. Like warrior monks from the NLC is one of my favorite things. Um, but then I also like Eden too, and um and I'm excited about the futures of Eden and um. Ooh. You mean there's a there's a future to Eden? It's not just going to be like a swarm of golems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there there's definitely a future to Eden. So if you do a search on DreamPod Nine form, you can just search Eden, and you get something like four thousand hits, and you can you can look at and read at what everybody's requesting, and there's certain things that they're requesting over and over. So it's oh. interesting. I um about two years ago, I was kind of bringing this up as a uh, proposal in a sense. And me personally, I wasn't so invested at Eden at the, at the time because there was only two models. Uh, right. But the more I got into it, the more I started loving it because now I'm working with the uh, the concepts that all the fans have been repeating over and over through the years and the, uh, the artist that's doing work with it. it I Yeah, I can't wait. It, it's it's going to be a good release, I think. Yeah, they seem almost like very 1980s sci-fi game show, um, kind of like Death Race, maybe, or The Running Man. Like, yeah. like we're, we're so bored that war has become a sport. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then and then, like, because of that, though, like technology kind of like plateaued at these little at these little golems, at least in my imagination. So I just love the idea of this like swarm of golems with lances like you know, yeah. hitting hitting the big red button to activate their rocket pack and just flying at you, Lance first. Yeah, um, yeah. This, this top yeah. That definitely has been just appealing to me and building within me. So when these come out, I'm definitely gonna be a fan of them. But yeah, I really like all heavy gear. I mean, one of the uh, things I love about all the factions is there's not really a perfectly good side or a perfectly bad side. I mean, even mm-hmm. the C doing everything for a reason. It's not that they're just evil and they have well, an evil. We're just, we're, just, we're just bringing back our, our wayward colonies. That's all. There's nothing wrong with that. Right, exactly. <laughs> Purely yeah. altruistic. Yeah, so for those of mm-hmm. you not not familiar with the Heavy Gear universe, CEF is Earth, and they are the combined mm-hmm. army of the of the universe, yeah. so it's basically flipped. So Earth Earth is yeah. the, the big bad with the high tech and the lasers, literally, uh, and are uh, showing up to do things. Yeah, exactly. Hypno-slavery for justice. <laughs> yeah no so it, it's it is actually kind of a cool setting though right i like the idea that, that earth is the bad guy right like the terra nova is kind of the the main setting which is where a lot of the factions have basically been abandoned and left to fend for themselves and then earth comes back and is like remember you guys are us you owe us a lot of taxes you know? yep. <laughs> um so we're just gonna come and take your stuff yep <laughs> <laughs> We have lasers. Man. We'll All share right, those so, lasers with you if you work for us. Yeah, exactly. We, you know, we might have taken them from another colony to be subjugated, but that's not a thing. You know? we're, we're sharing. Um, sharing is caring. Yeah, it's it's sharing. the CEF way, right? Oh, yeah. Like we're, you know, it's it's very Star Trekky, and we just want everybody to live in this perfect vegetarian space utopia. Um, yeah. <laughs> We'll we'll send in these really big tanks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Diplomats is what they prefer to refer to them as. Um, so, how long? So you've played Heavy Gear. It sounds like basically since it existed, right? Because was there was I don't think there was an incarnation of Heavy Gear before the card game. Right, right. Yeah, the card game was the first thing. I've been kind of on and off throughout the years. Uh, I got a lot bigger. Or I got more involved with it, I should say, when uh, when Blitz was happening, and I started um, doing mm-hmm. uh, demo open stores, and I even did a demo at a convention. That was a lot of fun. So I was a Pod Squad member for a while. Oh then, yeah. man, I remember the Pod Squad. Is that still a thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, it is still a thing. It's going to be uh, pushed a little bit more when we uh, when we finally finish the 3.0 book, and that's out. I think that the focus is going to shift 
to make sure that the pod squad is being supported fully. Gotcha. So it's basically just like a like a volunteer game ambassador yeah. sort of group. I'm just sort of it's kind of like workhorse for for DP9, I guess. Probably the easiest way to explain yeah. it to Infinity people. That's cool. Yeah. It- Exactly. They would ideally be running demos and things, and maybe they can organize a tournament and uh, give out sweet prizes and things. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll 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 look at getting that back up when the when the book's finished and out, which shouldn't be too much longer. I know oh, very cool. Well, great. So, how long have you been? I guess now part of the the actual like internal heavy gear team. Uh, two years only. Um, so I'm still kind of new to this. Um, I was okay. retired from the military. And um, when I retired, I literally, on the way out, I saw that I had time available. I was looking at the website and looking at Robert uh, doing some of the things. And I, I just reached out to him and I said, hey, man, I can help with this stuff. And uh, after I retired, I went and visited him in Montreal. And uh, now here I am. You got suckered in. No, right. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. So I guess you've probably been working on the 3.0 rules that whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been very focused on the uh, the Blitz 3.0. There's other areas that um, could also use some attention um, as far as the other games and stuff. But I don't think I can I can divide myself that much more. So I got to sure. I got to yeah the Blitz rule. Um, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, we've got the RPG team that's starting to work on the RPG team or the RPG, excuse me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm really excited to see what they come out with too. Um, they're they're doing an awesome job. They get together well, and they're saying all the right things. I really appreciate them. They're also kind of like my my backup brainstormers. So I'll go to them, start chatting with them about things, and they'll tell me when I'm crazy and maybe I should you know not do X Y Z. And no, they're they're a good team though. They're great. Well, awesome. So, all right. So you've you've come on for for two years, and <laughs> I guess the the big question is, what is the um, what has been the hardest part of writing the three rules for you so far? I tell you, it's it's amazing because it's it's hard to understand outside. Because as a fan before, I used to you know complain like fans do. We do, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, Inside, I see how it all moves, and uh, honestly, the biggest thing I learned was patience with myself. Honestly, because it's kind of like if if you think about it, my job is to look at the boundaries and to make sure the boundaries are right. Like for example, if something's not good enough, I need to push the boundary. If something's a little too good, I need to figure out how to pull the boundary in. But at the same time, I have to present that thought both internally and externally. And then I need to wait and just be criticized. And I have to just breathe it in and just let the watch over. I get excited. Be patient with myself, you know, and be patient with myself and say, okay, if this can be, de- can be done better, let's do it better. And uh, there, there's kind of nothing that makes me more motivated when Dan saying, this is right. yeah, it's, it's whether I get cantankerous or not, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we're here to evolve the game further. So it doesn't really matter who's right per se. So patience with myself, I think, is the is the biggest thing. Yeah, that's hard too. That's yeah. Uh, <laughs> I I am not. <laughs> yeah, patience is really hard, but to do it for yourself is very hard. Is I think harder, right? Because you, you're you're with yourself all the time, and you're always like, oh, I could do mm-hmm. I could do this faster or whatever push yourself harder but at the same time you, you all like you said you just need to you need to sit back and and just take it all in and, and let let everything just sort of settle mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. Post something up whether i post it up internally or, or externally you know i'll, I'll automatically that, that feedback and sometimes i want to jump in immediately and talk immediately and i just gotta i gotta wait and i gotta let it wash over and i gotta let everybody get a chance to speak and then I got to acknowledge when somebody is saying something that's very important. And I need to acknowledge oh, maybe my idea wasn't perfect first, but we can all work to articulate. Because, yeah, I mean, uh, hundreds of fans working together is going to be more than just myself by myself. So, Sure, a lot of thinking, a lot of iterating. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
So then, then the last question before you've escaped the 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 interview, uh, at least the the direct interview part of this, um, is what is the one thing that the community could do to help you the most? Uh, honestly, voice their opinion uh, on Pod Nine forums. Uh, that's a good place to voice it because um, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Well, I'm I, I don't mind really like. Um, the reason I say that is because uh, when it's in when it's shown over a whole bunch of different types of social media, uh, that's perfectly fine. Like if people are having conversations on Discord or Facebook or stuff, sometimes people just want to talk, and it's not necessarily my place to go chasing down those conversations. Uh, but DreamPod Nine Forum is exactly that. If they're talking on DreamPod Nine Forums, um, we're going to start seeing things repeated over and over. And there's certain things where it's like, oh, you know, they keep mentioning this. Maybe we need to put a little bit more focus here and and delve a little bit deeper on this one point and stuff. And I, I say that because sometimes I've seen something where initially it, it was hard to get going at first. But the more it was mentioned, the more it was like, OK, we got to we got to focus on this. Let's let's see what we can do here. Like, for example, the Eden stuff. Um, there are literally thousands of comments on Eden over the last 10 years. And if you look at it, you you start to get a very clear sense of what the fans are saying. And really what it comes down to is not so much me trying to make the rules for me. I'm trying to make the rules for the community. So it's kind of it, it doesn't matter necessarily what I want in Eden. It really matters what the players want. At the end of the day, I want people to enjoy playing the game, period. Fantastic. So, yeah, go to the forums. Um, Joe, maybe. Nah, Joe, you can go to the forums, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what of what, what uh, Infinity's uh, most infamous rules lawyers is in, is in the chat? He's, he's a great guy. Uh, yeah. And, and he will definitely find the holes in the rules. I'll tell you that. Yeah, no, Joe, Joe, is, Joe is fantastic. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad that I'm glad that he 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 knows himself. Um, so, <laughs> all right, great. So, uh, yeah, before we before we do a deep dive, kind of into the 3.0 rules, maybe we should touch a little bit about how to get into heavy gear. And John, you wrote you wrote a big fat article on this. Oh, well, that's not really a big article, but I wrote it this morning. Um, basically, it's it just explains most articles I write. <laughs> it basically covers the the basics of everything. So you go to lumberingsbracket.com and there's a getting started link. You just click on that, and then there's a there's a link to all the stuff, the official sites. So you get all the news straight straight from um, Robert, the CEO. Um, there's the online store if you want to throw money at them. The forums we just talked about, of course, there's a Facebook group. There's actually a Discord too, but it's invite only, so you have to go to the Facebook group and ask somebody there. Uh, and they'll get you. They get you in. Um, there's a, there's a little bit of. Um, I'm just sort of recapping the article now. You can go read it in more detail. But there's basically, uh, as we sort of reference a couple different versions of Heavy Gear, right? There's the card game we talked about, which isn't available anymore. There's Heavy Gear the RPG, which is like, you know, you sit down. There's a GM of some kind, and they take you through the story. There's combat in the story, which is like Heavy Gear Tactical, which is a lot more detailed, has a lot more rules. And there's what we're we are playing, what we've been talking about, which is Heavy Gear Blitz which is the tabletop version uh, where you have a lot more models on the table and it's sort of like a grander scale than the RPG where you have a little squad of people doing their thing. Um, right yeah, now, it's kind of, it's yeah. kind of the resolution difference like between yeah. Blitz and Tactical. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Heavy Gear Blitz is taking this, you know, the combat with these gears and basically reducing it to like a playable um, strategy game. So yeah, yeah. Heavy, gear, Heavy Gear Tactical is more like playing Battletech and then Blitz uh, is more like playing Alpha Strike. Right. In terms of rules complexity, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in so, terms right of up, scale, it, uh... sorry, you were saying, Rooster? Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh. I was just going to say, I would. Blitz is very like platoon level, where yeah. uh, the RPG mm. is more modular in a sense. Like you can vary the the scale. You can take it down to the cockpit view of one gear pilot, or you can take it up. You can definitely take it up to platoon, but it's almost like the larger you take the scale, the the uh, the slower the game will go. So it's kind of more meant for smaller groups of gears, where Blitz is meant to move quickly with like a platoon size 
of uh, or a platoon element. Right, and yeah, the kind of the easy way to describe it is Blitz. Blitz play, plays more like your your standard miniature strategy game. Your soldiers are gears. They have roughly the same capabilities as a regular infantry does in most games. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the super deep complexity has been abstracted out, uh, mm-hmm. but it's still there in the tactical game yep. in the RPG, of course. Yep. Right, right. So the three rules are not out yet. They're in beta. There's an active uh, thread that you can discuss the rules in the forums. The forums, the rules are also available for free on the forums. They're just a word doc. You go get them. The link is in here. There's also this lovely fan made um, army builder thing called Gear Grinder. Uh, and it's just like yep. giant tables of stuff, and you can you can it's 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 an army builder. You can click on things like I want this in my list, and you can click on the the little plus thing, and it will add it to your list. You can add this thing to your list. There's a filter function, right? So it it does the army builder thing you want. Um, it's got its rough edges, but it works. Um, so you can definitely do that. Um, and then you know the other thing is you need to pick a faction. There are a ton of factions. There's a ton of sectorials. Basically, like if you're a, most of you have who are watching this probably have played Infinity, right? So most of um, the factions in Heavy Gear have sectorials or sublists, or whatever you want to call it, right? So like uh, uh, there's some restrictions placed on what you could do, and you get some benefit from it. Uh, and you can actually pull in um, units from other factions as well. So basically everything is both a sectorial and like NA2 at the same time. You can like mix and match up on a bunch of stuff. It's actually pretty flexible, which I which I like. So um, you definitely run the danger of buying all the things, uh, much like you would if you if you bought um, if you bought into any NA two sectorial in, in Infinity, you might end up you know like oh I'll just I'll just play Dashat and because like, I already play Yujing and all of a sudden you have like a Assassin Baram army and you're like what just happened? Um, so that is definitely a risk. Right. Um, one of the things that I will say coming from other war games, um, it is a little bit daunting sometimes to build the models. I personally had a huge problem with it, right? So if you just look at, um, if you just look at like these sprues, right? So there's like a bunch of different weapon options on them and you won't use all of them, right? So like, Mm -hmm. there's like, I don't know, six guns on this sprue, you use one. So um, Mm -hmm. that is awesome because you can actually exactly model WYSIWYG what the gear is supposed to be carrying, what the profile is supposed to have. So your opponent can say, oh, I see you have a light auto cannon over there. Okay, I know what to expect, right? You don't have to tell them anything. It yeah. just is that thing. But that means, you know, you end up with a fragillion different profiles, right? Uh, that you, that you could legally model. But it really just boils down to these different... So this is, this is an F616, which is a CEF gear, right? They named them numbers for some reason. Anyway, then there's like different weapons loadout, anti-tank, makes sense, right? Recon, assault, support, those are all like words that make sense in the context of wargaming. Um, anti-tank has a big gun, right, or a missile in this case. Uh, and then they have a bunch of various upgrades. So you can give them a command upgrade, a stealth upgrade, or a mobility upgrade, and you can have all of the upgrades, none of the upgrades, two of the upgrades, right, and you can mix and match. So that immediately generates a combinatorial explosion of different profiles and different possible configurations. So don't yeah, build that's also why the whole thing. So that's why jumping into into gear grinder right away is you're gonna look daunting. like there's 80, 85,000 different things. Yeah. It, um it. so when it comes to a, a miniature building side, if you yeah. like so I grew up on GW games and building, you know, 15 million space brains. Um building the heavy gear models to me feels a lot like building that. Right? Where like I've got some variation on the pose. Um, the legs may or may not, you know, have different poses to them. Uh, and then I cut off the handle of the gun and glue it to the top. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So it's it, from a miniature building side, like if, if you're used to infinity models, especially if you're used to the modern infinity models where they've managed to reduce the sculpt to like three weird potato shaped pieces that put together to make one beautiful little Peter miniature. Yep. Um, not that. No, <laughs> um, you, you definitely have a instead, bit of analysis paralysis. You're like, oh, do I do I put the is the light auto cannon the right loadout for this? I don't know. What what if I'm locked in forever? And you're like, should I magnetize everything? And then I basically what happened to me was Adam sold me his uh, old Kickstarter stuff that he didn't want because he was only keeping North, and so I got all his Caprice and CEF, and he was like, yeah, you deal with this. And then I got into Infinity and didn't pay attention to it. But part of the reason I didn't do that was because I had no idea what to assemble. Right, like 
do I glue the laser gun or the multi laser gun? Right. Like which one is it? So I ended up like panicking and not doing anything. So just don't glue any guns on when you first start. That's proxy like for, start, yeah. Yeah. Proxy for exactly. your first few games. And then you're like, oh, I hate this yeah. gun. I don't want to use it. Then glue the gun you like on. Right. right. And I think similar to more similar to Infinity than 40K in the sense that I don't so far I have, you know, I haven't really experienced like this is the potato, the potato profile with the potato gun. Like, never take this profile with this gun. It's just stupid and bad. Yeah. Like the, like what might end up happening is you're like, well, I actually just don't care for grenade launchers. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, well then you don't have to build grenade launchers, right? You'll you'll be fine with or without them. It, you know, you're gonna have less blast packs, but you know you're gonna take like laser cannons instead, which are better at winning the face face rolls. You know, there's a lot of personal preference involved in the weapons. Yep. Not. Yeah not a situation where it's like, this is the clearly superior weapon. I will only take that. Right. Yeah. And as far as, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, definitely. That is one thing we, we definitely focus on is making sure that all options are viable and there is no false option. You can literally pick this game up and just decide, I like these guns better. And then you put them on because you think they look cool and it works. And yeah, you can totally do that. Yep. That's basically what I did. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and and as far as like figuring out what to buy it's easy you go to the site you buy the starter pack and then you're done for quite a while right so yeah, right basically what you're looking at in this picture is the starter pack plus um plus some infantry models and the infantry models i bought like one i want bought one blister of infantry models for like 20 bucks and this like made all the things here uh so it's pretty mm-hmm. pretty great um i mean you end up with more points in the starter pack than you'll put on the table in general for most factions. So I think that's a pretty safe bet. Uh, and I would say that like, I don't know, maybe this is controversial, but I, I'd say if you're going to buy like one additional thing, grab a, like a blister pack of infantry that just gives you like a different yeah. feel for stuff. Um, right. It's, yeah. It's just yeah. Easy, I mean, to, easy to, way to, to give it the, mm-hmm. to give it the correlation for people that, you know, the play infinity, the starter pack comes with, over a hundred points, a hundred points is what you play with on a four by four table. Mm-hmm. So if you want to play on your infinity size table in the game that takes about as long as an infinity game, um, the, all of the boxes cover that with options. And yeah, then right. like it goes up from there. So like the North and South, I think have the least amount of points and then mm-hmm. it goes all the way up to uh, utopia, which has over 330 points. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And their starter pack, yeah. so it's like uh, enough that you and somebody else could split the box and still have enough stuff to build full sized armies with a couple options. Yeah, okay. I mean, and and the other thing, unlike Infinity, the starter box is actually like you're done for a while, right? Like you're not going to yeah. be bored. You you won't it won't be like oh you have three Zanchi in your your you know Yujing starter, but I also need the Zanchi like special weapons pack because I need the guy with the HMG because I can't really feel the Zanchi link without the HMG. There's none of that. You just buy the starter pack, right. glue on the gun you want, and then you're good. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, it's... and and you go can go, go. I was gonna say you can go in all kinds of different directions after you have the spider the uh, the yep. starter set. You can go with special forces. You can get some aircraft. You can focus on indirect fire. I mean, there there's so many different directions you can go with it. You, uh, electronic warfare. Uh, yeah, I could I could name tons of things. So it's it's definitely got spaces for everybody to explore and build on. Yeah, I think the only armies right now that don't have starter packs and probably will not get plastic starter packs are uh, Black Talons and Legalists. Um, and I would probably say that neither one of them you probably want to start with anyways. So don't worry about it. True facts. <laughs> yeah. The starter packs are an absolutely Black safe bet. Yeah, Black Talon can be tough to use. If if you're new to heavy gear, um, if you if you hate yourself, start with Black Talon. Now, that being said, we are trying to do things to to make them more user friendly to a new player. But yeah, they're they're definitely one of those things that experienced players even have trouble with. So <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, it, you know, you're not gonna be bad if you start with Black Talons, but just yeah. like starting it's like starting a difficult army in infinity, right? You're like, I'm going to start with JSA. And it's like, well, okay, you did this to yourself, buddy. <laughs> yeah. 
But that said, I mean, you know, you could you can pick them up, you can mess around with them, just expect to not be good at them at first. And then the more you practice with them, the better you get. So I shouldn't say don't start with them. If you want to start with them, honestly, you, you can start with them. They're not they're not that bad. It's just uh, there's a lot of nuance in the rules that um, that they go into in a sense. And they're very not forgiving of mistakes, as my Raven quickly learned uh <laughs> against john in our game yeah yep. it's basically like playing limited insertion all the time if you make a mistake and like two dudes die it's over mm -hmm. yeah right right, right. Except, except you know in this game where uh you know your your opponent might be having you know 10 to 15 models and you might have six right right <laughs> yeah and, that, and that's a good point because he can lose one or two models the opponent and he's okay. He can recover. It, it's only like the other the other factions. You can make mistakes and keep moving forward, and it's not the end of the world. You make too many mistakes with Black Talon, and you're done. Yep. Yeah. They 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 don't. It's it's an attrition game, and they don't have attrition. Right. Uh -huh. So, yeah, that's. I think that's a pretty easy way to describe getting into it. Like honestly, like buy one of the plastic starter packs, and you have enough points. Yep. For a for quite a while. Um, right. yeah, and, you, and, and we yeah, have plans to put out more more beginner friendly content in the next couple of months. So uh, we'll, we'll excuse you know, we can expect to see some of that soon. I don't I don't know when that's going to be because that's there's a lot of content that we have to generate for Burnham Academy, the show Infinity Academy, <laughs> and Earth Rocket. So it's happening, right? But uh, you know, but if anyone wants to see anything in particular, let us know because that'll help us focus our attention too. So. Do, do reach out right well so to help somebody here get started uh john do you want to pick up bring up a picture of that box if you can um next month we are going to be reviewing the latest kickstarter round of miniatures which is basically the the new coal utopia and prdf sets that recently came out and we are going to be raffling off to someone who's listening the prdf starter box so just because we're lazy, it's going to use the exact same algorithm as our as our other prize picker. So literally, just show up, hang out with us, chat, and one of you guys could uh, win. There you go; it's on the left there. Uh, yep, one of you guys could just flat out win an army of Peace River. Thanks. So there, you, there you go. Like we're going to get people playing this game. It's fun. It's a good time. Peace River is like nomads. So, They're also painted red. They have ECM everywhere. <laughs> oh my god. They they're pretty rad. I was looking at some of their profiles the other day and I'm like, maybe I should just open up that box and you know, we haven't announced the raffle yet. Nobody's gonna know they're missing anything. Um <laughs> <laughs> but but between like the, the ECM on damn near everything, and then they they've got like one guy, I can't um the Argos, right? It was one of their like heavy support gears. There's Armor nine and five one between their uh, between their hull and structure, yeah. like yeah, just they... just rude, just just a big slab of armor. And, and then they have really dude. fast stuff. Oh, that's the cataphract. Yeah, my favorite, one of my favorites. I love the cataphract. Tell me when the dark cataphract is going to happen, please. Um, yeah, so Peace River is pretty rad, and yeah, somebody who's listening can walk away, or not walk away, sit on their butt away um, with a free army. <laughs> so, yeah, right, it's the embiggened vulture. So mm -hmm. do that thing, watch us next month when we uh, announce our next Heavy Gear episode, and that could be yours. So with that, I think we can start getting into the, the future of Heavy Gear Talk about the 3.0 rules. Rooster, okay. why don't you start off by telling us what what one thing are you most excited about with the 3.0 rules? Oh, I think it's the uh, the flexibility, really. Um, that was one thing in... Um, yeah, it, it's like... Sorry, right? There's so many things I, I'm excited about, but the flexibility is important because there's there's more to that than just saying flexibility. I can put a force together in about 30 minutes. I can throw them on the table, do a demo, and I can go through the rules um, and, and teach people rather fast. I really, I really enjoy teaching people how to play heavy gear. And uh, one of the things I zero in on is, is I like teaching people how to beat me. And mm. 
It sounds stupid because it means I, I, I enjoy nothing more than teaching people how to beat me. So it means I lose games. But at the same time, I feel like I'm accomplishing that. Not only that, but I don't want them to just I don't want to just tell them this is how you use meta to beat me. But here's how you beat me in the way you enjoy. So like I got, I'll let them build up like if they like indirect fire, if they like electronic warfare. I'll zero in on that and I'll tell them, you know, these are the things that you can do with it. And then I'll teach them how to beat me. And then they, so it's like they've explored their own options and they managed to do it without too much fuss and then play a game and win. And yeah, it's cool. I love it when I, when that happens because I feel like I've accomplished something. So that, that's probably when I, when I say what excites me the most, it's the overall flexibility and it sounds simple, but there's, there's a lot to it. Nice. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of those things where I played, geez, I played tactical back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. I did play blitz 1.0 a bit. Um, mm -hmm. and then I kind of fell off. Right. And then, so coming back with blitz 3.0, I've basically forgot everything I knew, which is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And from what I've been reading the rules, they do feel a lot smoother, a lot cleaner. Um, and yeah, it, it also seems to promote a more flexible way to play the game. You know, I remember there was quite a while, at least in the meta where I was playing, um, where basically like airdrop, just airdrop. That was the answer to everything. Like, well, mm -hmm. you took artillery. That's really nice. I'm going to airdrop this thing in here. It's going to fuck off all your artillery. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it, it definitely feels like a more balanced approach this go around. So I appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to. Um... It's sound like I'm, I'm reinventing the wheel. I have to acknowledge David and Cloud, and I have to acknowledge all the heavy gear writers that came before me. I'm not necessarily doing this scratch. I'm, I'm building on a foundation that they put lots of time into. So I don't mean to make it sound like I'm doing oh, sure, it. Oh, sure, sure. I, I, uh, yeah, I've, that's, that's what I'm, one of our big focuses has been, is uh, how to be flexible and how to get players to pick up a new option and just run with it. Yeah, no, that's really cool. It's, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So why don't you, uh, why don't you start telling us, uh, regale us with some of the lovely things that are coming. I'm sure not everybody has been following the beta as closely as we have, and there's also things that have changed, I think, since the uh, the current live 3.0 beta. So yep. why don't you yeah. give us the goods? <laughs> well, um... I'll start from kind of, or I'll summarize what's been going on over the last few years. Um, there's a lot of models that are coming back, like uh, Nemesis Jaguar. That's one of my yeah. favorites. There's going to be the uh, the Southern Special. And if you ever read about the Southern Special story, it's it's a really cool story. I like that. Uh, Northern Years, um, Dart Jager. Um, he's come back. Now, he's a model that's already for sale. He just wasn't in the previous version. So now he's been made available again in the rules so people who have dark have to stuff them into the closet they can pull them out and use them uh, along with nolis the basilisk the copperhead the rattlesnake water vipers are coming okay i'm stoked about the water viper um yeah. back when i play, i don't think there's ever been a water viper model this will be a first yeah back when i played south i was like how do i make these things like gluing pen caps to the back of my um basilisks i think i couldn't remember like it was awful i i've <laughs> always wanted a water viper and now that i don't play south they're finally coming out <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were waiting for you to convert <laughs> that's really what it was like okay he's fully invested in north now he, you know yep. he's he's trying to find his crazy eights patch he's never going south and mm -hmm. let's uh <laughs> let's come out with it this is the time yeah so there's the water viper so mm -hmm. on its back those are basically underwater rocket tubes. Right, right. Yes. So that, cool. That's a lot of fun. I, um, I'm, I'm so happy to see that thing coming, honestly. And, um, but yeah, we've got that one. We've got Dark Warriors. We've got Dark Massives. We've also got, um, or Dark Hoplites, excuse me. The Dark Massive was already there. But um, we've, uh, we've also got things that our focus on variants like there's the uh we have grizzlies already but we'll have a defender grizzly so it'll have anti-aircraft missiles on it basically um is and there's a lot be, of what's that is the defender grizzly going to be like a whole new sculpt or is this going to be like a couple little accessories that i add to a plastic grizzly it'll be accessories so if you've already got grizzlies you're in luck oh, that's, 
jump in the store, buy a few parts, and then you're ready to go. And that um, is and perfect. Don't underestimate those anti-aircraft missiles either. You can use them against gears, and they do good things against gears too. They're just tailor-made to go against aircraft. So, but if there's no aircraft on the table, you can still use them against gears or tanks or whatever. It's still a missile. Yes, yeah, still a missile. Exactly. It still goes boom. Yeah. So there's a lot of new variants um, and and old variants that were there and are or uh, kind of got lost along the way, they're coming back. Uh, one of my other favorites is the Spearhead Hunter. I like that thing. Ooh. That's going. That'll, that'll be another model that's kind of, it's never been there before, and we're, we're bringing it in. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the one I'm really looking forward to is the Armored Hunter. Yes. Bear Hunter, Armored Hunter. Yeah. I, a, I don't know why I love the Armored Hunter so much. Probably just because it's basically like an indestructible little ball of steel. Yeah. Yeah. With a mortar. Yep, yep. And then for certain models, we we started realizing, okay, hang on, some of these models have some cross faction stuff. Like if you look in the old Perfect Storm book, you'll see where Nuco uh, they purchased aircraft or choppers. So why don't they have those in the Blitz rules? And then Black Wind, it was made to be a stealth aircraft, so it goes with um, the Black Talon perfectly well. I already uh, have Air mine. Peregrine, uh, that's another attack helo or VTOL, I should say. And um, it's literally made by Caprice. So Caprice could also have those available too. So some of that was um, just making those things available to people. No, that uh, makes oh, yeah. sense. Like it, it's kind of using, using the products you already have um, in new ways. Right. Yeah, the, the black wind is so rad. Yeah, it, there was definitely questions on the forums over the years where it was like, hey, how come my Caprice can't use a Peregrine because they're made on their planet? And we were like, well, yeah, actually, that makes a lot of sense. And then when you start reading in the old literature and the old lore, you're like, oh, yeah, they should totally have the Peregrine. Yeah, the Peregrine also looks so cool. I really like the way the flyers look in this game. Um, it's always bugged me in, you know, like I played 40K for years. It always bugged mm -hmm. me that none of the flyers looked like they could fly. <laughs> um, yeah, except Here's for the, except for the Eldar tape some, like, some stubby wings too. Yeah, with with enough thrust, right? Like that was just yeah. like well, enough thrust. Like Thunderhawks fly, like, it's fine. It's fine. What do you mean? Um, so how about what? One of the things I noticed that has popped up in a couple of places now is the boa. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is a model that I I really like. I don't think the card shows the actual model on the. Uh, on the the army builder john but if you look at the store you can see it it right. is a chunk i mean so it's it's armor nine hull structure five one right so it's just a beefcake um and i don't think is i don't know when this model came out and i never remember it from i never remember it coming out before but yeah so that's another fun one that showed up in a couple places yeah, because it and and, and again, uh, and I don't, I never want to claim all this stuff as my ideas. This is stuff where the fans were like, "Hey, the bow is in the south, but the bow is also in New Cole. Uh Why is it not in both sections when we talk about the faction like model lists and stuff?" And I was like, "Oh, yeah, you guys are absolutely right. It should be in both." Right, right. And that beautiful thing. There, <laughs> there it is. Um, and this one is big enough. Where I believe the the body is made out of resin. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, Joe. Oh lord, he coming! Like he's <laughs> out of my way. I I need to have one of these for my new call. Um, it's oh, yeah. <laughs> he's just gonna belly up and shoot whatever he wants. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So that's I mean, that's exciting, right? Like I've always, you know, for example, I've always loved the Titan. Um, it's such. I mean, it's it's a hand. It's a space hand. It looks like mm -hmm. a hand. It's a space hand. Um, hind, whatever, yep. whatever. Um, and you know, if I do new call, I believe the the Titan shows up there. There it is. Exactly. Yep. So that's a great model too. That's. I'm going to sit here and I'm just going to keep saying that's my favorite model because they're all my favorite. It's really <laughs> cool, though, because it's like unlike the other flyers. Uh, I mean, the other flyers have like guns 
and close air support stuff like rotary cannons, rotary lasers, like big missiles. This one is artillery rockets, which is also rad. Uh, but this one is also an APC, so you can put infantry in it, and they can repel out and and do horrible things to people. So pretty rad. Yep. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna suggest it here. Um, a dark titan would be heavily appreciated by the Black Talents. AKA just my, gonna point that out. My Adam. Have you <laughs> Black Talon chain of command. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, spe- speaking as, um, yeah, if we're all Black Talon players, I assume. Um, I just want that thing painted in black, dropping off the kick ass Black Talon infantry up the field. I mean, they already air, it's fine. I want them, I know they have air deploy. I literally want to air deploy on the table. I want to do the thing. It would, it would, it would um, be, yeah. speaking of Black Talon high command, it would be fun to do a uh, heavy gear sort of global tournament thing like uh, uh, Asteroid Blues or something like that. Oh, man, that'd be so cool. The platform's already built. Yeah. Pieces of war. I don't know, I don't know if you've, you've seen this, uh, Rooster, but Infinity, the, the company that made it, Covers Belly, partnered with um, is this company to, to make a global campaign where basically uh, you would pick a faction at the start, play a bunch of games. The games would, like, the, the missions would rotate, like, week to week. I think it was, like, two-week periods. Some were one-week periods, I think depending which year you would, you did it. Uh, and then basically like uh, factions could try and take a particular point. And uh, what, what the, uh, if uh, a faction like won particular mission, a bunch, they would own that point. And based on the outcome of like who owned what part of the, the map at the end of the campaign, the story would change and they would actually get written into the source books. So yep, yep. it's a uh, pretty, pretty rad. We talk about, we we do talk about that, especially once everything launched and the book's done. We'll we'll definitely have more time to look at stuff like that. Excellent. That is super rad. Yeah, I just want an excuse to to get more toys. I mean, yeah, seriously. So. <laughs> um, do we really great. have right after a certain point, or can we just say, you know, what we're doing? We're buying more toys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I yeah. want toys. It's totally fine. So what else? Have, uh, so okay, so that covers a lot of the miniature side, right? Right. Yeah, and uh, I th- other things we've been doing, right? So uh, we've been fine tuning a lot of mil- like a lot of models. Um, mm-hmm. it, it gets really in the weeds, but getting in these weeds is very important because we we really need every model to perform on the table. There should be no such thing as buyer's remorse. You should purchase a model, put it on the table, and enjoy using it. Period. And uh, and by all means, if you feel differently about any of that, please go to the Dream DreamPod Nine forums in opinion, because I'm always looking for stuff like that. Um, there's only so many things that, like, I can play um, a whole ton of test games, test game, test games, but it just doesn't. It's not the same when everybody's playing games because no matter what we do, there's always going to be a group of people that does it differently yep. in a different way. And in a different order that you wouldn't expect, if you know the reference. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, if you find something you don't feel is right, by all means, I'm I'm highly open to those those kinds of conversations. Because yeah, the last thing we want is buyer, buyer's remorse. But yeah, the, uh, we've been really fine tuning many 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 models, and um, it gets in the weeds. But just to let you guys know, we're doing that for everyone, so that um, are there. In- are there any neat little minor tweaks you can maybe uh, tell people about that they might see coming? Um, oh, heck, I've, I've done so many of them. Uh, let's see. Let me open. Well, like, for example, Utopia. Actually, that's a good one. If you look at uh, 2.0 Utopia and you compare uh-huh. it to the talk that I have, you'll notice a lot of little changes and stuff. Some, is, some of that is to make them tougher because they are a swarm force to some degree. You can use the Gilgamesh command tank and you can use the Marduk, but if you want to make them a swarm force, then yeah, they've got all those drones and you could do that instead of the Marduk or instead of the Gilgamesh or instead of a combination. They've also got gears in a sense, They're, they call them apes. But um, but yeah, if you wanna go heavy swarm force and you've decided that uh, Utopia is your place, <laughs> We, we have definitely tweaked all kinds of little stats all over all of them to make sure they weather some storms a little bit better and put out more damage a little bit better and then also work smoothly together. So you're not necessarily opening the book and constantly looking at rules and stuff. You, it, it should all just get intuitive after. Um, yeah, that's a good 
Very nice. And then, yeah, sublists. So sublists are another thing. To um, it's uh, this is where we can promote things in a sense. Like, for example, if you really like stripped down gears, like the stripped down hunter, you should know that UFP is one of the places you'd want to go. If you really like Strider, you should know that Humanist Alliance is one of the places you want to go. And so we've really focused on making sure we're emphasizing things that players would find their niche and then call to them to those sublists that they want instead of just mm. doing like restrictions per se. Because there's some so there's some sublists that were real heavy on restrictions, and when right. you pack you as a uh, as an old school heavy gear player, it all makes sense to me because I'm like, well, yeah, of course the UMF reduced sales of the Jaguar to the WFP and stuff. And we can all really get into that and have a lot of fun with it. But at the same time, the new player coming in is like, why can't I get this? Why can't I get that? Why can't I get this? So instead of focusing on restricting access to things, we focus on, all right, well, what would the WFP really purchase? What would they buy? What would they use as war machines? And then, of mm. course, it's... And so we said, okay, well, let's focus on making benefits and upgrades to that. So that way, if that's what you want, that's where you automatically go. That that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's more um, with the carrot instead of the stick, right? All right, exactly, exactly. Um, because yeah, the, especially new players, they're not going to necessarily relate to all the old literature. Uh, because yeah, there, there's I don't know, there's 30 plus books, probably more. I'm, I'm probably not doing it justice. There's there's tons of old lore books in camp that you can go through, and you just can't fit all of them into the Heavy Gear Blitz book. So when you're put based off the people don't necessarily, but if you're putting if you're just put up saying hey, you can add this upgrade to Hunter, then people will go, oh, that's where I want to be. I like the WFP. Boom. That's what, and, and I do like the WFP. <laughs> They're a lot of fun. Um, yeah. editing, editing has been huge. Um, it is a constant thing, because as soon as we edit something for clarity, we realize that maybe we could uh, tweak it a little bit to work the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and then we and the next thing you know, it's first order, second order, third order, fourth order. It's it's you start extrapolating out and going through rabbit holes, uh, and then you come back and you realize, oh, now you got to change that sentence again. And so, uh, but yeah, we're we're heavy on making sure that there's a good chapter sequence, the uh, the rules flow. Um, so ideally, it you should be able to open the book and from the beginning understand where you're at, where you're at reading, what part of the chapters you're. So if you're a new player, it should hopefully. Uh, ideally click as you go um yeah i kind of noticed that when i was reading when i was reading through the rules of the beta um is the 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 3.0 rules to me just read quickly i read all the rules like in bed <laughs> cool, From, cool. You, know, you know minus all the tables obviously and all the the, sure. the unit profiles but just like the actual rules of the thing i was like well i'm gonna sit down and read this thing and like i was finished with it with it after a couple of episodes of Park and Rack, and I, Rack and I went to sleep. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I it, think, it digests really easily, I think. And I, I think, I think yeah. it's important to, to call attention to the accomplishment that that is, right? So, I mean, it's, it's still a work in progress, obviously, but, um, you know, we were just talking about how the, the, the DP9 philosophy is to make sure that, you know, there's never buyer's remorse. You, whatever you buy, you can use. And you know, making right. tweaks to keep old players happy, and also making tweaks to keep new players interested and engaged. Because like I haven't read all the source books, I'm doing, I'm starting that process now. Um, but like I don't know which many, one are you on? I'm on um, the uh, life on 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 Terra Nova. Okay, good. That's so, the good place to start. Yep. So I started mm -hmm. that one. I'm I'm reading it on my iPad in bed, uh, like a couple pages a night before I pass out. So it's slow going, but it's happening. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know any of the acronyms. I'm just like, sure. Uh, I guess what 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 faction has the best guns? And then I ended up uh, playing the laser gun <laughs> faction, um, and I'm, it, I've been happy with it. Um, but it is a massively over constrained design problem, right? Like you have to keep keep track of like, you know, what tokens are in stock, uh, what right. um, you know, what ancient model that nobody really buys anymore but still exists, and people have it in their collection. 
And then, you know, there's like right. one person that uses this obscure uh, variant that's quite powerful in the right combination. And you have to make sure that like, oh, we, we made this one change to how forward observation works, but now it makes this like one strider like super broken and everything else is fine. It's just this one strider is super broken. And if that happens, immediately what will happen is people are like, I'm going to go buy that. Um, because gamers right, love right. to min-max the fun out of everything, right? I mean, like, we, we saw that happen with the Azrael and Infinity. When that came out, people were like, I want to buy the thing, and it's out of print, and you can't find it anymore. So, you know, like, that, that happens all the time. So I think um, I, th I think it's important, you know, for those for those people, like, being like, oh, you know, why isn't it done? Why isn't my suggestion uh, in being implemented? It's like, well, there's, like, a million other things going on, and anytime you make one change, like, you know, like Rooster said earlier, like, there's, there's fourth order effects going on, because you have to, you, like, all the ripples spread through the pond as, as you, as you, as you start making changes. So uh, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I haven't necessarily uh, commented back on the forums, uh, uh, promptly. Uh, like for example, they've been talking about, um, like water depth for a while. And, uh, I know they, they brought the topic up a long time ago, but yeah, just ripple effects, chasing all the ripples. I'm, I'm finally getting there and uh and yeah definitely taking in what their thoughts are what they would prefer and uh and trying to yeah water depth was something that i i felt like like come on let's streamline this like how deep is the water it is right. we don't <laughs> we don't need to go into like fractions of an inch deep like right, is, right. is it is it water or is it deep water um yeah. but i think you've i think you've uh, you've taken that note and internalized it next i'm going to get you on woods um, <laughs> and then, how many, how many trees are there in this woods? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I know, right? But um, if I shoot the woods with a laser cannon and it sets on fire, does that generate a smoke cloud? Right. Oh my God. Yes, That's the thing it should. You can do it in BattleTech. I'm just saying. I know. Oh, okay. And then you also have to like track your what your water rations for your noodles in BattleTech, right? That too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but. No, I think that that kind of streamlining though goes a long way to making a game approachable. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. It's it's hard when you approach a game and you have to like, okay, well, so let's how are we going to mark the depth of this part of water? Is this part of the water deeper than that part of the water? Like those kinds of little details just end up people being like, you know what? Let's not use water. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And we don't have false options. We don't want to have things a. You don't want models that don't really work very well on the table. But b. You don't even want to don't do anything on the table everything on the table should have a function and it should be a relevant function to the game yeah yeah oh great so that'll be nice and yeah like i said it's 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 easy to read it's kind of funny because it's it's an interesting combination and this is absolutely throwing shade at your writing style um it, it's uh not exactly light and airy yes um I actually have somebody helping me with that believe it or not so when the book does uh get public um i have somebody on the rpg team who has been uh mentoring me on okay. how to make my writing a little bit livelier because i know i was 20 years in the military and a lot of my writing is military and medicine style so it's very direct and very it breaks down steps but it's not exactly the funnest thing to read and i am very um very uh aware of that i should say yeah it, i i appreciate so kind of like it it, it fits yeah. well with my preferred reading style it's it's clear it's when, nice. when, when john and, and i first read it yeah when we first read it i think you equated it john to like reading a government technical spec i was like oh this is and, great <laughs> i just finished reading one of these for work yeah it's which is nice because it actually it makes things pretty dang clear even when there are like um even when there's like an exception to a rule, it's very clear what that exception is. Um, but at the same time, like I, I grew up reading like Rick Priestley rule books where it's basically like half novel and rules intermingled between with questionable punctuation, which may or may not completely change the intention of an entire paragraph. Oh, let's um, not get into that. So like that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the style I grew up with. So reading this, it was, it was jarringly straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. But on the flip side, I was able to like read it, understand it, and start internalizing it after like right. one quick pass in an hour. Cool, cool. That's awesome. It's good to hear these things. It really is. Um, and yeah, it's not necessarily a dig. You don't need to um, 
Yeah, where the placement of a comma could determine if your army is balanced or not. That describes 40k yes. in one sentence. Oh, um, yeah, not saying you need to to make your your uh, <laughs> what what you type more eloquent uh, or more flowery is the the word, but um, I've, got, I've got super thick skin. Um, I, I take all in uh, in. Well. Uh, once in a while, I'll get cantankerous, but not over stuff like this. No, it's it's. I like the fact that people say this here. <laughs> but like I said, I understood it, so I'll take it. Right. Cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, Computer Jerry brings up an excellent point in chat, which is rule books have two incompatible tasks: teach new players and be a reference mm-hmm. during play. There, are, I've seen rule books that are are a good mix of that, but they usually do that by having a how to play section and then the reference. So it's kind of cheating and really should be too. But uh, yeah, so so right, I think right. I think uh, this is definitely a, a excellent reference for sure. Cool, cool. Uh, other than that, there's uh, let's see, there's little quality of life tweaks that have happened. Like okay. in uh, it's 2.0, every now and then you would come up on an action to where you're running at top speed, something's at suboptimal range, et cetera, et cetera. Next thing you know, you have zero dice to roll. And <laughs> <laughs> nope. Again, I gotta be careful because I don't want to say I'm doing something better than the last guy per se. I'm just building no, on sure. what. Uh, but yeah, there there was definitely little things where I'm like, okay, hang on. The the minimum die you can roll is one d six. So even if you're going for those wild crazy shots, um, go ahead, take a shot. You can you can still do it. There's not too many of those in heavy gear to where you're constantly rolling these ridiculous rolls and nothing's ever gonna happen. It's very onesie twosie type situation, but yeah, it, this goes into quality of life. Uh, there's an evade order. Um, well, there was an evade order. Now there's an evade action. Uh, okay. So quality of life thing. It's like this model's commander is dead, and he wants to try to not get shot. It would make sense that he can choose to do that on his own instead of looking. To- <laughs> yep. Or- there's- oh yeah. Right. There's no boss telling me not to get shot in the face. I guess I'll get shot in the face. Yep. And if you're interested right. in learning right. about all the dice statistics and what 1d6 actually means for you, there's an article on Numbering Sprocket which goes into gory detail and all the all the. Yep, yep. It's. Oh my god! I loved seeing all this math though because that was one of the things coming to this game. I'm like, what is better? Like getting yeah. a flat plus one, getting a plus one to my skill, or getting an extra dice? And yep. the answer is it's an S curve in three dimensions. So, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Right. Cause like the, the infinity equivalent is if you get an extra die. It's basically plus three to your ballistic skill. Right. In this case, you're mm-hmm. like, well, going from one D six to two D six is great. And you can kind of stop after three, three is good enough for most right. situations. Yeah. It's definitely diminishing returns after three. Yep. Um, was the like super easy breakdown that we figured out. Yep. Yeah. Well, I would say don't underestimate the defense die because if the yep. defense die is three and you have three, you have an advantage because margin of success. But uh, yeah, uh, watch your opponent's die too. It's obviously you want to have more die than them, but it's not all about that. I've seen many times one die beat three die, so it just it's the way of the dice. Yeah. Right. So in you know again, kind of like in infinity terms, like you can you might be burst three against their one dice to dodge, and sometimes they dodge. Right. Yep. Right. Right. Um, and also one other interesting thing here, actually, like well, I'm just talking about that comparison to infinity. Um, when you do an attack in heavy gear, it's my attack against your defense dice. And then if you respond with an attack, it's mm-hmm. then your attack against my defense dice. So it's entirely possible for two gears to shoot each other in the face. Yeah, yep. it is. It, it's not the most common, but it is definitely funny when it happens, when both gears just unload on each other and they both die. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and if you have equal dice on attack and defense and equal skill, the average result is nothing happens. Well, I thought the well with MOS zero, the average is going to lean towards the attacker still. Slightly, yes. Yeah. The, yeah, depending. I mean, well, uh, then then you get into unless you're agile. Well, but then but then you get into if your uh, if your damage and armor are the same, then it really then it goes down to a four up. So it is statistically that's like right down equipment. the middle. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of little hidden things in there to where it's like, for example, the rifle, the rifle has the uh, precise trait. And yep. I want to make sure I give credit to um, the uh, the Brigand rule set for kind of developing this idea. Uh, I don't want to claim it as mine by any means. But uh, but yeah, there's 
there's a beautiful thing with sub because it cancels out the agile trait in a way. It doesn't do that exactly. Uh, but the way it works, it works like the old 2.0 rules in the sense that it cancels the agile, but the player doesn't have to think about that anymore. They just roll the dice and it does it automatically. Oh. Uh, so so mm. now would be a margin of success of one with precise. But if you literally have a margin of success of zero, then in 2.0, that would have just been a straight miss. So now it's like the way precise and advance works, it counters the agile without prompting the player to to see what counters what they just keep rolling the dice like like normal and they they don't have to really dig themselves in or get into the weeds themselves so that's that's a very clever and and uh, elegant it's sneaky fix i like it all right Damn, uh flying models uh we've got the airstrikes we were just talking about adding napalm today that's a uh, yeah and arrow four fast cam so yeah. artillery deployed mines. Mm -hmm. Those, those non-battle yeah, yeah, yeah. types. All these things. Do all these things. So yeah, airstrikes are actually one of those rules that um I uh I'm gonna use on John next game. <laughs> I'm so mad at myself. I took two airstrikes against you in our last CEF game and I forgot. Did you to use, really? I, yeah, I had ninety two TV on the table and eight points circling, you know, in a holding pattern stacked up. Establishing air superiority is what you mean to say. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Why don't you uh, Why don't you go ahead and describe actually, Rooster, what it is? Yeah. So airstrikes. Um, yeah. You can basically everything on the ground. They they take their turns. They do it. Then the airstrikes or the aircraft can come in and perform their airstrikes. Um, you can. You've got a few options in there. They can do that on their own. Or you can have a forward observation, like you've got a guy on the ground, he calls over the radio and he says, hey, here's the coordinates, hit this target. And then the aircraft will come in and hit that. Or you can, uh, you can even use the um, airstrike tokens as a defense against other airstrike tokens. So when one of them starts to come in and strike at something, you can use it to intercept it. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of interplay there, and uh, there's a lot of decisions to make with the airstrike tokens. Uh, they're definitely something that is easy to add to any force, uh, and that's a nice thing. Um, and yeah, yeah you don't need a target designator for them. You, yeah, you don't have to. You can. Uh, you can just do regular forward observations. You can do a forward observation with a laser target designator, um, or you can just let them strike on their own. I mean, there you you definitely got a few options there. So yeah. Uh, force construction has been revamped. It's uh, it's more flexible. Uh, there were definitely situations in in uh, prior releases where the force construction was very, very um, uh, complicated. And uh, I don't mean to put it down. Like I said, uh, I don't want to be greater. But it, there's <laughs> definitely that, that was something that we've been listening listening to for years, where people are like, "Can we can we streamline this?" Because especially, you know, if you're sitting there and it takes you three hours to make a force before you can play, that's that's a that's a turnoff. So, yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely, force construction had to be uh, made flexible or as flexible as possible. And that makes sense. I actually so I played 1.0 a fair amount, um, and I kind of liked the the force construction back then, where you bought your squad. Mm -hmm. um, but it did make like spending odd points an absolute pain in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I've got enough points left over for an extra gear but i can't take one <laughs> yeah as a matter of fact i just put together seven forces today and i think it took me maybe an hour or two and i was able to put them at the exact point cost that i needed um i could throw in some upgrades to plus or minus a few points here and there um i could pull this model out put this thing in instead and yeah it just flowed it makes the whole process to me um more fun but definitely i look at the players and i ask them you know what what do you like? Because uh, I've I've played a lot of different games over the years, and one thing I've noticed there's there's the players who really get into it, and they build the forces, and then there's other players that are like, man, just can you make me a force for me? And then um, yep. And uh, certain games, I kind of look at them and I say, come on, man, you gotta you gotta get in the game and learn how to make it yourself. And then they just want to quit, and it's like okay. Um, but then I kind of look at the lessons learned from that, and I'm like, well, 
uh, with certain games, it really is a job to put the force together. And if they're looking at that and they're seeing that job, well, of course they want to do something different. And so, yeah, so force customization, force flexibility, being able to sit down and put a force together rapidly is, yeah, it's it's huge. It's a very big benefit. Um, but yeah, see, other things. Uh, orders. So orders, uh, fine-tuning those so that you have more flexibility on how to use them. Uh, mm -hmm. But not only but making the team do that, because orders are communications actions. Uh, so then that brings in electronic warfare. And does the electronic warfare gear or model have its use? And yeah, this is a, this is a big point. You could use them against the orders. You don't have to. You could totally take your electronic warfare uh, model and use it as a target designator, the forward observer. You can use it as the guy who just puts an ECM defense bubble up and helps to protect your guys. Uh, there's, yeah, there's more than a few options there, but the orders have been fine tuned. Um, yep, so they when play. You say, when you say orders, because um, Infinity players might get a little bit confused, orders aren't what you use to power your gears. Those are actions in heavy gear. Um, orders in heavy gear are kind of like the, uh, the command abilities in the GW games, where it's right. like your. Your commander says, "Do this thing to a bunch of guys." It's command tokeny uh, for in, in in Infinity players. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like a command token. Mm -hmm. you can, Except you, you can, can jam it. To do re rolls. Yeah, you can jam it basically. Yeah, so you can you can do like the most common use is re rolls. You can use it to buff attacking. It's it also yeah, support wear is a good a good uh, a good analogy. So. You can uh, you can make things uh, take out of turn actions because uh, that's one thing in in uh, heavy gear that we focus on too is making sure that the because uh, you take turns in heavy gear it goes back and forth but we want the passive player the guy who's not taking a turn to be able to play the game even when he's passive and uh, that sounds counterintuitive at first but when you when you start playing it you see it and it's like uh, the orders like for example let's say you've got a, a giant aller tank that has just come around and it's getting ready to zero in on your guys you can pop smoke you can throw an ecm bubble up there's there's a multitude of things to do to counterplay that you're not just stuck just getting shot by this giant tank so mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that's something that's going to be very in uh kind of very natural to infinity players too is this yeah. um making tactical decisions at every point of the game instead of just when it's your turn. Yep. Right. Also, like, hacking yeah. hacking is a thing in this game. It's called Electronic Warfare. Um, it does yep. all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, yeah, I haven't even mentioned the haywire. Like, just, yep. you know, attacking the, elect or the electronic systems of another model. And, yeah, make them do the stutter step, literally. And, um, it is... See, yeah. Is it more or less like space magic than Infinity? I'd say it's probably less. Yeah. Because, like, yeah. it only does one thing. You aren't, like, magic missiling somebody with Trinity from around the corner, right? You're, like, like yeah. Ba basically, like, the, the, the deal is um, you... There's a state called Cripple, which is, like, so, so things in Heavy Gear have hit points effectively and when you get to like roughly half um you you become crippled and then you're like bad at everything you lose a die on all your attack and defense rolls you can't move move anymore you can only move once um and some right. parts of you may fall off like your cool mm -hmm. your cool gear may have gotten shot off um and so what ecm attacks do is they just put you in the crippled state and turn off all your ecm gear yeah yeah and that's actually really important when you're taking on things like the uh, the big tanks or the big striders. Uh, what you might want to do is try to haywire it first, and then come in and stab it with all the steely knives. Like it's it just right with gears because gears are not necessarily the king of the battlefield. Uh, they're good, they're cool, but they're they're really combined arms warfare. Yeah, focus on just to engage things like tanks, big tanks. I mean. Yeah, you're are probably like a good thing to do is to try to haywire that thing first before you have to engage it. So, but yeah, uh, EW has yeah. gotten a good overall. And um, a lot of the traits and things, uh, even non EW traits, uh, we look at trying to make sure that it's an, that it's an like the, uh, the trait that used to give you an extra action was called autopilot. So we just changed it to React Plus. 
do an extra reaction. So, mm -hmm. uh, let um, I think we lost you there, but oh. so uh, really quickly, yeah. So reactions, basically, you have to spend actions and reactions to be able to do anything. So when somebody does, uh, when somebody does attack you and you want to react to it. You have to have a token to do it. So in Infinity War, it's always free, right? It's always a yeah. free thing you get to do. Um, in Heavy Gear, it's actually part of the resources that you need to manage, which is very important and kind of a, a neat nuance to the game. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, and, and the benefit uh, to spending a resource to do it and then therefore not being able to do something when it's your turn because you spent it in reaction mm -hmm. is that you do it at full strength. Right, because in Infinity, you're yeah. down to burst one. In Heavy Gear, like you get to use all your cool toys and fire your biggest gun at full dice. Well, as long as it's in your hands or faster, it sure yes. So that's a pretty neat, uh, a pretty neat way to to, yeah, basically becomes a resource allocation game or a resource expenditure game. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so you were talking about the the traits when you cut out there, Rooster. Oh. Sorry about that. But, um, can you guys hear me okay right now? Yep, yep, yep. you sound good. Um, yeah, just for the listeners, I live in an area where the internet just kind of wanes a little bit, so apologies for that. But uh, yeah, tra traits are definitely one of those things where you, we want to make sure that it relates to what you're thinking it should do. So mm -hmm. React works with reactions, where autopilot, it didn't quite make sense. Yeah. Uh, it was fine. I'm what they started was was awesome. The core of what they built was awesome. But yeah, I've just been focusing on making sure the traits relate directly. In fact, I got to give some credit to Robert. He was the actual first person to iterate the word React Plus. So I got to make sure uh, give him some credit there. He's he's uh, he's been into he's it's not like all of this stuff is my ideas and stuff. He's been right there with it. <laughs> you know, get all the credit. Um, one thing that I noticed in going through the beta rules. And this is probably, to me, one of the biggest changes in 3.0 is the just the overall electronic warfare overhaul. Mm -hmm. um, I remember it being pretty absurdly complicated um, it, back in the uh, back in the days of these Blitz One and Tactical. So, yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what's been done to kind of streamline that? Oh, yeah. So you've got regular ECM abilities. They've got ECM attack, ECM defense, and jamming. Uh, attack is when you haywire things. Jamming is when you jam their comms and stop their orders. Uh, it puts up a bubble, and it mm -hmm. interferes with systems shooting at those models. So it's, it's, a, it's almost like a protection spell, in a sense. Um, so ECM, it's got those three things. They're, they work pretty quickly. You can just turn them on, do these things, etc. And then you've got ECCM, and of course ECCM, as you would imagine, would play against ECM, so they can do things like firewall, or AKA protect somebody from that haywire attack. And um, now those functions were there before, and that's kind of an important thing to note. Is uh, I don't want to make sure I don't want to make people think that I'm creating this for the first time. Like we had things like communications boostings, uh, electronic assist, or electronic warfare assist. Uh, so there was mm -hmm. stuff. It just didn't relate to anything electronic warfare. Like you could take a um, an ass, certain type of gear, which is one of the cheapest gears in the universe. Things like electronic warfare assist, and it didn't, you know, it made people scratch their head because they were like, "Well, hang on, how come this thing that doesn't have any advanced communications devices, how come it's playing in EW Warden?" Like, right. Again, so. But yeah, we we uh, we made sure that things like that they relate directly to a trait. So when you pick up a model and it says things like ECM and ECCM, you'll know. Okay, this is where I would expect to find these things, not necessarily on another model that doesn't relate. So, so yeah, uh, and of course, communications. Communications is it's just like skill. Like you're just rolling on EW skills. So you don't necessarily have to think of it as really a separate thing. You've just got your three skills on the model, your gunnery skill, your piloting skill, your electronic warfare skill. And by saying that, hey, the comms relate directly to that, then it doesn't trip you up. You don't go looking for another skill or anything. Very cool. Yeah, no, that was something that I think was always uh, pretty intimidating. 
kind of like hacking and infinity was a huge barrier for a lot of people to get into. Like it just felt overly complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, kind of reducing electronic warfare and heavy gear to like, am I attacking you with it or am I using it for defense or am I shutting down your comms? Like those are the primary roles of electronic warfare, uh, in the, in the setting. So like just kind of reducing those to more easily digestible, um, actions. Right. Right. I think works really well. Yeah, I remember um, um, definitely getting some games in where we went EW heavy, and this was you know probably four years ago, before I was a rule, rules rooster, and um, I was playing with somebody, and we both decided we were going to do all electronic warfare against all electronic warfare, and oh, it God. was like Cheetah versus Aguan, and I think it was like four hours later we had finally finished, and we both just <laughs> we were we, we were tired, we were definitely mentally tired. And, um, not to say anything bad, uh, it's just that, yeah, it is. There's definitely things where I've been focusing on building on the structure. And I haven't really changed much in EW. Like, in the electronic warfare or the ECM attack is just the haywire attack. That was there before. I'm just making sure that it, it reads smoothly. And when you it, you can figure out how it works quickly and use it without, you know, reading paragraphs of information. And going through massive flow charts. Yes, that too. <laughs> well, that's that's very cool. That that honestly, if nothing's changed in three point making the electronic warfare more approachable, I think goes miles. So, yeah, yep. well done there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so something kind of funny I was thinking about. John really likes infantry in mm -hmm. heavy gear, and I've got infantry for all my factions, and I I use it. It's fine. John really likes it. <laughs> so what if um what have you done to uh to kind of give infantry more of a place in this game? You know, it's it is a game about gears, but there's also we've talked about flyers, we've talked a little bit about tanks. Um what about just regular people? Oh, regular people are awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and that goes right to that combined arms warfare because it's like the the gears are not the king of the of the battlefield. You really need to think um combining the different elements and if it, it, it comes down to really what you want the more you combine the more successful you'll be like for example if you've got 100 tv force you're kind of limited on the number of elements that you can put in there but what you can diverse or whatever you can do to diversify the force then that's going to help you but infantry are great they're um they've been made better and I know there's a lot of contention about what they what they should be, and that that's definitely uh, because we we have modern infantry that can take out a tank with a missile. So it does when we talk about lore or we talk about stats. You uh, yeah, you definitely get in the weeds there with some things. But to to keep it kind of streamlined, basically the infantry, but they'll also take a little bit more damage. They're still sturdy. It can mm -hmm. still it'll take a lot of hits. If you put them. Oh, lost you again. I think we lost you there. Um, you check, check, mic yep, check. Yep, yep, there you better. go. All right. All right. What did uh, so? Yeah. So what I was saying was uh, infantry. They're it, they hit a little bit harder and uh, they take a little bit, or they die a little bit faster, but mm. they still die slowly. Like if you put some infantry on an objective and you're holding it. Your opponent's gonna have to work to get them off of the objective, yeah. and um, so yeah, um, and they're more diverse. One of the one of the important things to note about infantry is w one thing I notice is these are very small figures, and people will tend to make some mistakes when they're putting them together. Um, it's much more <laughs> forgivable. So if you make some mistakes, you can look at the rules and you can go, oh, that's okay, I can use it for this, and then you can you can still use it. Whereas before it was like you would possibly have to rip them all off the base and start over again so oh goodness um yeah so they you know they have quite a few different profile options and like they're always very annoying to to go against with don but that's also because he's using growls and flails yes which are space rains and terminators yeah but like the movie, movie marine version yeah oh yeah yeah um but I think that the like they're limited to two damage per or per attack, which feels really nice. Unless it's a dedicated anti-infantry weapon, so 
you know, you've, you've got your big anti-tank laser that you're like framing across the battlefield. And like, sure, if you frame through a squad, you're going to you're, you're going to vaporize two guys. Mm-hmm. But you're not yep. going to kill the whole mob of them. Right. Right. Exactly. So that, I think that works. I think that works well. Um, and I, you know, hopefully, or, you know, hopefully we'll see more of it on the table in 3.0. I think we will. They're great for holding territory. If you get infantry and cover, they're going to be a pain in the ass to get out. Yes, they are. Yep. Got to gotta send them and the you, grills. <laughs> yep. You, you'd be surprised at what they can do. Like, um, I was. Just, my raven was very surprised <laughs> at what that grill team could do with its heavy infantry support popping out of the, the transport that I just felt pretty chuffed about crippling. Yes, yes. They can jump out and one-shot stuff every now and then. And... Um, Feels great. It's in- <laughs> does it though, John? It does. I was there. It didn't. I don't think it <laughs> felt great. <laughs> <laughs> I I will well, say awesome. though. Awesome. So all yeah. Like so, I you're right in that I do like infantry, but I, I the real reason I like infantry is because I the thing that Infinity did not give me was a combined arms feel. Right. There aren't any tanks mm, in, in sure. Infinity. There aren't vehicles. There aren't airstrikes. I wanted all of that. And Battletech, which was the game that I would have played in the past, gave me all of that, but with like mm-hmm. reams of rules and just like tables and tables and like all the airstrikes are modeled by a plane flying around on a map. Like mm-hmm. it's all there, but Heavy Gear gives you to that. Heavy like Gear much... Tactical has that. That's true. That's mm-hmm. true. But, um, you know, like Heavy Gear Blitz gives you all of those things in like a reasonable infinity time frame in terms of like gameplay time, yeah. right? Which is what I want. And, you know, part of that is that there's a little bit of rock, paper, scissors going on, right? Like, if you have high armor, you need mm-hmm. anti-armor, and it does really well against it. If you have infantry, you need anti-infantry, it really does well against that. But if you don't have anti-infantry and you don't have anti-armor, you're in trouble, which means you just need to, like, mm-hmm. throw a bunch of dice at it until it goes away, right? And there are there are outlets for that, right? We just talked about how infantry mm-hmm. take two points of damage uh, per shot that goes through if you don't if you don't have a dedicated anti-infantry weapon. Well, if you shoot them enough, they'll eventually die, right? Those two points will add up over time. Similarly, right, like a lot of the basic weapons have AP1, which does one point of damage against things with high armor, even if you like have no hope of scratching the paint otherwise. So there yeah. are, they're out, out there. You're never like down and out, right? Like in Infinity, right. you can shoot at a big armored thing with a combi rifle and you might kill it. In this game, you can still shoot at stuff, and even though it's inefficient and bad, you'll still be able to do something. So you're always in the game. It's never just like total rock paper scissors. Like oh, I can't do nothing. Like I can't do anything. This is awful. Uh, you always say you. There's always some some hail mary you can pull, um, but at the same time, like you're rewarded for taking the right things um, to do the right jobs, and then uh, your opponent is punished for not having the right tools. So you know, like you right. you, you can make that. Um, uh, you, you can, you can, that could be part of your strategy, right? Like, so if my intent is to spam infantry and in, like hover APCs, get them to the objectives, dump them all out, throw mm-hmm. them into area terrain cover and be like, all right, now come dig them out. The next step I have to do is go mm-hmm. kill the thing that can do that. And if I've done that, then I can right. just sort of just like hang out and do other stuff and basically ignore you. Right. And just sort of like right. generally apply pressure. So, so I think, I think that's a, a really nice thing that heavy gear blitz captures that I don't think any other, other game system that I played in recent memory really, really gives me. Yeah. And the other thing I like about the infantry too, is they really, they define a sense of scale. If you've got gears on the table, you've got yep. tanks on the table and infantry on the table. To me, it just looks good. And, uh, and so not only does it play well, but it just, ha- it enhances the immersion too, at the same time. For sure. That's true. When you're, when your army is nothing but gears and you don't have any vehicles or infantry on the table, right. you feel like you've got guys in power armor. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, like Tyler uh, says but, in chat, need tiny guys so we need to know the gears are big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, that's true, though, right? Like, visually, that's a really important thing. Yeah. Right. You know, like, I made that, um, I made that, that stripped-down hunter conversion, and then I'm just like, great, this looks like a dude in pants. Like cosplaying a hunter, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like without without the context of knowing, like no, 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 this is really big, and he's got ballistic cloth on. Like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure he just has pants and boots. Um, so, yeah, I think that 
I, I think the infantry really have a, a solid place in 3.0. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's actually one of the areas that I think um, would be interesting for expansion as well. You know, there are... Most factions have, like, a basic infantry. Some factions have a faster infantry. Um, you have the Spitz, the, the Wallabies, the Jackrabbits. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, th there is room for something between a regular infantry and a growl. You know, the Black Talon infantry are a really good example of that. Or just, yeah. like, exploring new ideas of what you could do with the infantry. Um, you know, just to... I'm not saying that this is the a good or correct idea, but, like, just to get the conversation moving on the forums, I was like, what if we had, like, dudes with jetpacks and VTOL infantry? Like, mm -hmm. let's grab some rules that, that were never even considered for use on infantry and be like, well, it worked. Like, the mechanics work. Mm -hmm. Is it an interesting thing to add to the game? Well, I mean, flails exist. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and the flails are jerks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some room in there to to add to it, uh, by all means. Uh, yeah, and, and that's that's the nice thing is is really what you've got at Heavy Gear. It's not something that I did. It's something that many before me did. Is they created a really solid core they can be built onto. So it, there's a million directions we could go, honestly. Um, <laughs> But yeah, definitely. And, and again, I can't emphasize enough about people getting on the forums and putting their thoughts out there because we do really read those things. And and maybe I don't necessarily respond to every single comment, but oh yeah, we've noticed that that uh, that post that you put up there about the uh, the black talent <laughs> model and saying, "Hey, here's some ideas." And then yeah, of course. So we we read those things definitely. Just just spitballing, you know. <laughs> No, it's good stuff. It really is. And and I do like your ideas. I think uh having some jetpacks and stuff and uh and some flying uh infantry, that would definitely be very interesting. Well, uh, of any of my own ideas that I really liked, it's the um it's the Albatross, the uh, uh, basically a, a Black Talon flying infantry transport. Mm -hmm. Just or, or actually specifically the one that carries a, a gear. That's because I love the idea of this, you know, drop ship coming in low with some recon gear that it, it just detaches right above the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I think I talked to you before about this, but you know, Lucky Thirteen from um, what was it, Lev Love, Death, and Robots? Yes, yes. There's it, just a certain feel to drop ships, not the not the round ones from uh, BattleTech, but the uh, the sleek, fast ones that come in and drop infantry off or drop gears off in this case yeah there's there's a lot to be said for that yeah there's fun ideas and, that, and that's the cool thing it is kind of i feel like the game is going through a bit of a revival um and it has an opportunity really to grow from here i think the the 3.0 rules really set it up in a place to to play well with other competitive miniature strategy games you mm -hmm. know games like infinity that john and i obviously play a ton of um yeah. I guess not the last couple of weeks, but still, um, yes, yeah, it, it's we'll do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's there's room, there's both room in the market for it. And there's also, despite the fact that there is a huge product plan already for the game, um, there's still plenty of room to grow. And that's really cool. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And, and I think um, we've got we've got a lot of things lined up for 2021 and 2022. I can't talk about everything. Uh, we already know about Eden. We already know about the RPG. Um, and then we already know about a lot of the models that we talked about tonight, like the Spearhead Hunter, the Water Viper, etc. cetera. Uh, there's even more stuff than that. And so uh, I think the... It, like it'll, the it'll, Harrier? Yes, the Harrier. Oh, we, we <laughs> didn't even mention that one today. And that's, that's an awesome one, too. And, um, but not not even just that. There there's more stuff there that that um yeah, I think the fans of Heavy Gear are really really gonna like the years 2021 and 2022. It's all just gonna keep going rapid succession and uh there's gonna be something for everybody. Sean, yeah. look at that. Look at that. Look mm -hmm. at that. I, I like, I'm already like, gonna get into Peace River after New Cole, so don't worry. <laughs> right? It's like uh, you know <laughs> no additional like, if, convincing required. Cheapest... Right. Like, what if cheetahs were fast? We're like, oh, cheetahs are already fast. No, no. What if cheetahs were fast? <laughs> like, and, and it's walk hover. It's walk hover, which is. 
Oh, it's so and, good. Adam, I think you like you like uh, ferrets, right? I love ferrets. They are such a classic, aren't they? But then you've got gerboas. I know, I know. I, I was I was really hoping you'd be like, well, guess what? The Mahler ferret is coming, and I was gonna spin in my chair with excitement. But no, gerboas are also rad. All it's right. the other it's the other faster butt wheel right right exactly it, but they all they both have their place honestly yeah so nate asks um how slash where can we see the new releases um the uh the new models yeah so um there are some um Feedback Friday posts that were put up on the forums uh that's where you can find some 3d art there were some uh posts released on facebook uh, the, uh, Tony is the 3d artist for new pod nine and he's been doing an amazing job. Um, so yeah, we've like, for example, you were putting up that water viper. That's, that's Tony's work. And, um, so yeah, you could search for those models. If you want to look at the stats, of course, you can download the Excel sheet. That Excel sheet is going to be put into the layout process so that it'll actually be a model table on a book that you can read. Um, so those are a few sources. Great. So, um, yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll see a new website in the future to keep everything consolidated in one place. But yeah. I mean, there, like there are there's yeah, news posted on, on social media on, places, on DP nine and also the forums. So uh, another question, you might not have an answer for this one, but would be deep or would uh, DreamPod nine consider releasing stills? Stills as in just like artwork, the three D files, like 3D yeah, printing stuff. Oh, yeah, I definitely can't answer that. We are actually talking about those types of items, though, um, because we we um, I shouldn't say we because I'm not up in Montreal, but there are a lot of molds and um, and I can't emphasize them enough how much Robert does to maintain some of this stuff. And and uh, and I say that because nobody will never understand some of the, some of the stuff he has to put up with coming from me. Uh, as a matter of fact, because I'll, <laughs> I'll be requesting things and requesting things. And he's meanwhile, he's got like 600 molds to maintain and he's he's got to put all that stuff into action. Yeah, uh, there are there are 698 different items available for heavy gear blitz of the miniatures. And yep. some of those items, they take like five molds just to make one model. So, yeah, there's there's times where. um Where I'm talking and I'm requesting and I'm talking and I'm requesting and, and then I've got to pause and. And take a step back because I'm like, oh, I'm I'm hitting that that skew, aren't I? And he's like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there there are there are tons of things. But so one of the things we've we've been chit chatting about is uh, as we add to the 600 plus molds, um, is there a better way to maintain some of the uh, the molds that aren't as frequently used? And yeah, so we we've been we've been discussing 3D. Uh, renders and things like that and what to do with them now where exactly that will go i don't know i think it's a little bit too early for me to say anything on that but um but yeah we have been talking about it right that is kind of an interesting way of the future right where you no longer you know it, once 3d printing I mean, it's pretty much almost there but like, you'll be able to print on demand and whatnot right um and stuff like that that's kind of cool as opposed to having to maintain large silicon molds that said pewter forever like Give me my yeah. metal minis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, that was that was fun, man. I think uh, I think we'll have to do that again sometime. It was really good having you. And before anything goes, well, you've wasted another perfectly good evening listening to late night war games. John, why don't you uh, talk us out a little? Yeah, well, if you have any questions for us, you can hit us up at mailbag at latetonightwargames.com, and we'll we'll get that email and answer it on the next show. Um, just a reminder about Roman Academy missions. You can check all those out on romanacademy.com. Uh, Infinity Academy, infinitytheacademy.com has some help if you're getting into the game. We um, are live here at 8.30 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays every week. Um, on Twitch, we upload the resulting video to YouTube and the audio to all of your favorite podcast apps. Next week's episode is going to be ITS Missions Part 3, Area Control, featuring, featuring uh, the Frontline Quadrant Control, Safe Area, and Supremacy uh, Missions. So, yep, if you like what we do, you can support us on, on Patreon. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'd like to, to thank all of our Patreon patrons, of course, 
and our new sponsor, DreamPod9, and our our uh, our our sponsor, uh, Mythic Games. That's right. And next episode, we're going to be doing ITS Missions 3 Area Control. So this is going to cover Infinity ITS Missions uh, yep. Frontline Quadrant Control, Safe Area, <laughs> and Supremacy. <laughs> Basically, get all your stuff out of your deployment zone. Um, and uh, we'd love to give a special thanks to all of our Patreon patrons and to our sponsors, DreamPod9 and Mythic Games. Um <laughs> Rooster, did you want to give a plug, give a shout out? Anyone yes, and everyone. Yep. I, I definitely have a plug. And, and sorry, this is going to take me a moment. And I'm probably going to miss names because over the last few years, I don't know if I can count the number of people that have been involved with this process. But let me give a shout out first off to our Supreme Overlord, Robert Dubois, a.k.a. my mentor in this madness. Uh, Samuli Ora, uh, Rolando Meja, Eldon Calgor, thank you for your art. Kayuna. On Soshite Seosan, Domo Arigato Gozaimashita, uh, Killian Landerson. Uh, I think you'll like what we're doing with Eden. We we spoke a lot about that a long time ago. Nick, Spencer, Owen, David, and Alex from the RPG team. And then from the forums, there's VFXX, Estales, Warpound, Vapor Links, Brian Harris, The Direwolf, Black Ducker, The Archer, Fritz Cat, Mimpy, if I'm saying that right, I Santa Cruz, Gear No Bad, Gear Shop. Shaman, uh, Paladin395, Byzantine Falcon, Quiet01, Savant, Space Squatch. Thank you for getting the game in with me. BF225, Garbage Goat, Gabriel, Petrie Westman, Zeno, and last but not least, Ashley Pollard. I really appreciate everybody coming and sharing their time with me and uh, and helping me with all the madness. And definitely, uh, and definitely a shout out to all the rules gurus before me. Um, I am only as good as as they have made it. Well, thank you to you for coming on and spending your time with us tonight. Yeah, hey. I, oh, another thing. I didn't mention uh, Frank. Uh, I've actually gotten games in with Frank, and uh, of course, thank you. I appreciate that, too. And of course, Adam and John, thank you, guys. Well, you are, you well, are very thank, welcome. Thank we haven't you. done much, but we're, we're happy to help however we can. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and sorry about that glitch in the matrix. I blame Joe entirely. Um, <laughs> if you like, <laughs> you've done it two shows upset. in a row now. I know, I know. I just I'm reading the script and I'm focusing on the script and I'm going to write names in front of things. Okay. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. All right. Well, if you um, if you still like us over our amateur show here at the very end, uh, where yeah, I'm just going to repeat everything John says again. Then um, be sure to catch us on Facebook, YouTube, and anywhere you catch your, you know, anywhere you get your podcasts. If you like us, please take a moment to give us a five star rating on iTunes. Follow us on Twitch, YouTube, subscribe, um, all the little stars, hearts, etc. Yeah, you did hear it twice, Dex. Um, yeah, all of that will help us give you the best content that we possibly can. And more importantly, keep me liquored up so I continue repeating what John says. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for playing me through college. And most importantly, most importantly, Patreon. Go check out that thing. We have a couple new Patreon patrons this month. Unfortunately, um, this is actually something we should have mentioned a little bit earlier. We do have to change the way that our Patreon is supported. It did technically fall underneath the Patreon raffle uh, restrictions. So... No more gambling for miniatures. Instead, what we're going to do is switch to a monthly program so that we can put up a swag store on our on our Patreon where you can actually just straight up buy the limited edition models that we are raffling off. So even better, you can just get them and not have to wait your turn. Yep, pretty much. Not have to pray to RNGs. <sighs> right. Or oh, sorry, the wheel of names. Jesus. All right. Names, names, names. Well, with that, thank you very much. Take care out there, and we'll see you next week. Have a good night. And with that, thank you very much. Take care out there. We'll see you next week. Uh, 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 Won't you play games with me? And I like to do everyone. That's what I like to do. That's what I like to do. That's what I really like to do that's what
what I really like to do.